What's going on, everybody? Cali Death Podcast back yet again. We are here again on another Thursday. This is episode 120. I'm here as always. I'm your host, Anthony Trapney, and I got a couple of resident homies with me, Joel and Casey. Joel Horner, Casey Howard. What up, y'all? What up? We should have the Professor Joseph K later on. Um, tonight, we're we're joined by somebody who, uh, again, guys. Uh, oh, by the way, did you see that light go out? Yeah, I'm fucking. <laughs> oh, okay. So did I just did I just uh, freeze again? God damn it, dude. Now oh, you look good. All right. So, anyways. We are here. <laughs> the technical difficulties that you guys have been seeing for the last couple of weeks, I'm still dealing with them. I'm still making this thing happen for you guys every week. So just give me props for that, guys. Um, but yeah, we are joined by somebody who I truly have been touched by throughout you know, my career in death metal. I've had a few intros like this, and I'm glad to have an intro like tonight with this man. Um, he's part of so many different releases um, that are very important to me and have been important to me still throughout my whole entire career. Tonight, we are joined by James Murphy. What's going on, James? How's it going, guys? Uh, you it's know, good to be here with you. It, thank you so much, dude. And it's really great to be here with you as well. Um, I'm glad that we were able to make this happen. And yes, dude, before we get into the nitty gritty, as always, we're going to uh, do the plugs up top. First one, as always, battleforgecoffee.com. Get your coffee from our homies in Deeds of Flesh. They're working with a, 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 good, comp, a good place to get their coffee. They got a good roaster working with them. They got the merchandise. They got everything you guys need over there at battleforgecoffee.com. So please support the underground death metal homies. And then for us... CaliDeathPodcast.BigCartel.com. Still got some shirts there for you guys. A couple different uh, designs. The OG revamped and the two-year anniversary full-color zombie podcast guy t-shirt. You can uh, support the show by purchasing those. You will get that bagged and handed to you in the mail. Well, handed to the mailman from Joseph, and then it will get to you however it gets to you. But Please, that's how we that's how we get a little money to make this thing happen. Um, anything else on our side, guys? I don't think there is. And James, well, for me, for me, uh, you mentioned uh, Arizona <laughs> green tea. Thirty years with no kidney stones and counting. <laughs> <laughs> yep. If you need an iced tea that'll keep you hydrated and no kidney stones. Arizona iced exactly. tea. Exactly. Didn't they used to put the 99 cents on the can too? So they would make sure that nobody sold it over that price. Yeah. And uh, they've, they've slowly phased that out. Yeah. I remember Not as fun. a kid, it would say 99 cents. Huge. It, it was, camera. it was that right up until just very recently. And I think like really the circle K near me started selling for like 129 recently. Uh, damn. That's a big jump. <laughs> End of an era. <laughs> <laughs> know, right? <laughs> yeah do you have any like any kind of thing to promote as far as like are you giving lessons do you have any yeah, do you want do you have stuff, do you have stuff website to anybody you, you want any website you want people to go to for the all-encompassing uh, james murphy information yeah i mean you know you can you know find me on all the the usual socials i'm you know probably most active currently on facebook but I'm ramping up my YouTube. So the main thing I would want people to check out is my YouTube. I'm start. I've got uh, several videos in the works, and I'm going to be, uh, you know, ramping up on that and uh, trying nice. to improve the quality on that because you know, so far I'm just you know, iPhone and uh, and that's it. Um, you know, I'm an audio guy, not a video guy, but I'm going to have to learn how to be a video guy. Right. Uh, there's a lot of videos I want to do, and uh, totally. you know, and. Uh, uh, yeah, so so basically, just uh, Facebook and YouTube. Really, you can find me. And, uh, I think I'm uh, at James Murphy producer on like both of them. Nice. Okay. Yeah, I, cool, I believe cool. so. What kind of videos are you trying to put out? Are you trying to put out like playthroughs and stuff? Uh, yeah, I'm gonna do I'm gonna do playthroughs. Absolutely. Uh, 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 current plan is to um, 
go through and do pretty much every solo I ever did on record. <laughs> oh, <laughs> on a record. I have That's to relearn cool. them to start with. And then, you know, and I'll, and I'll uh, play them, present them. Hey, this is how I played this. Give us an explanation. And then I'll probably make, you know, just so that it can be, uh, this is going to be very time consuming. Uh, yeah. And, uh, so, just so that it uh, sort of, you know, pays for itself and, you know, maybe helps pay for some lights or whatever. Um, I will uh, do a Patreon as well, where I'll offer awesome. the PDFs, uh, you know, uh, Guitar Pro files mm -hmm. and extended videos, you know, with the explanations and all that sort of thing. And, I, you know, I'm going to do some reviews and things like that. Uh, currently, I got coming up. I just installed this awesome Vega trim tremolo system on uh, my 91 oh, Fender sick. American Strat. Cool. And uh, it is freaking amazing. And uh, I'm going to go into detail about it. I've already did a unboxing video. And now I've, I've uh, and that's up. I've done an installation video to show how easy it is to install because it doesn't require any modification to the guitar at all. And wow. uh, then I'm going to do a, uh, you know, a video putting it through its paces while I'm doing a guest solo. And uh, very cool. Yeah, so that's, so, that's what's on the horizon right now. Just, and, uh, you know, I'm doing I'm doing some other things. I got uh I got this uh, um, X5 uh, in-ear monitor system. Oh, I'm cool! Gonna a, I'm gonna be doing a full, you know, full review of this, running it through its paces, and uh, also uh, KSR Engineering. Uh, got some uh, some of their great stuff, like the Vesta, uh, the Hera, Hera, and the uh, uh, EX5. And I'm gonna be nice. doing uh, some in detail, you know, in-depth videos about those. Nice. And uh, some other stuff. I'll probably do a video or two where I go through my entire comparison guitar. Oh, I love comparison roster that I have. I uh, got quite yeah. a few of those, and uh, yeah. So that's the plan. Stuff like that and, and playthroughs and little mini lessons. Okay, Ooh, that's cool. cool. I might do those as shorts. I don't really know. Still trying to make up my mind. You know, this is this is a new uh, it's a new world for me. You know. Right. Are you right. are you going to do any lessons on like one on one lessons? Are you offering any of that, or is it just going to be on the YouTube? And Patreon? I'm thinking about it currently. I'm just uh, I'm really only planning on uh, the YouTube uh, uh, tuition stuff. You okay. know, there's so many amazing players these days, and there's so many guys that are just incredible and already have their teaching slat you know tuition game down on YouTube. So mm -hmm. for me to dip my toe into it, you know, I want to make sure I do something interesting or something that's uh, you know that makes sense for me to do you know right uh, james that's, why that's people super might want that information oh, okay. from me you know yeah. right totally and i was just gonna say that's super exciting dude just because um you know for uh the generation that i come from hearing you you ogs on the early records and stuff and and how the and i'm not trying to make this it right off the bat in uh editing situation in the studio blah 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 but i'm just saying that like there's certain things that you guys had to learn and adapt to at that age with the the, it, the little amount of technology that you guys had that time at that time so yeah it really is all we we like to talk about how things are all in the fingers and um it really does shine from that era because of the fact that you guys had to be so natural and organic in the studio. So I really enjoy hearing that somebody who had plenty of experience pre-internet and all that and pre-technology now wanting to, you know, dip their toes in the current state of of how things work, you know, play through videos and this, this, and that. I'm sure you're not comfortable or not necessarily comfortable. What I'm saying just is it's not part of your wheelhouse because that's not really what it was like. If I wanted to play through video from James Murphy back in the nineties, yeah. it would have been a shitty fucking bootleg VHS, VHS tape, tape yeah. you know, and, <laughs> yeah. and, and you would have to, you know, know the right guy or seek it out to really find probably the shittiest version you could probably come across because it's been dubbed over so many times and sent yeah, yeah. Through, you know, well, now with the red, I was just gonna finish it with with the ready access of having 
the knowledge of somebody like James Murphy readily available uh, with a few clicks on your computer. I, I, well, I, I like that. And I like that you want to be able to participate in that as well. Yeah. I certainly hope people see it that way. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I just confirmed it. Confirmed I'm at James Murphy producer on YouTube. So go there and add me and subscribe and all that good stuff. Perfect. Oh, yeah. um, so that I can, you know, feel you know motivated to do this. Um, I think I'm I think I'm under three thousand subscribers right now. So, and I guess that's the thing you got to push your subscribers. Yeah, you know, for me, going. this is this is not my uh, natural habitat. You know? mm -hmm. Right, <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, but uh, you know, I'm adapting to it, and uh, I'm finding that I'm enjoying it because uh, I'm in control you know right yeah you know, that that's beautiful i think i think there's uh uh as you mentioned you know this this is a whole new world with the uh with the technology and and you know social media and all that and uh you know what it boils down to is it's like anything else it's there's uh pluses and minuses there's good and bad to it mm -hmm. and uh you know you mentioned like sort of all the editing and all the you know uh, you know that's that's certainly something that some bands embrace and you know and, and yeah I'm, I'm very old school i didn't even have a four track cassette recorder until i joined testament you know? wow. <laughs> i did the my initial demo that i did to to get interest from roadrunner for uh disincarnate um i did by bouncing back and forth uh guitar tracks and a little you know analog drum machine i had um wow uh with a, a a boom box and a double cassette deck <laughs> and a couple Ooh, of cheap no plastic microphones you know Dude, <laughs> i got that done it was really you know uh necessity is the you know mother of invention they say so i had right, to come right. up with a way to make it happen mm -hmm. um you know and then eventually you know so yeah every i mean everybody's got a digital audio workstation in their computer hell in their phones anymore these days right exactly and uh um you know, I, I do think that for, for, for new artists, for old artists like me, it's really cool because uh, it, it gives me control and I have sort of a ready made audience. That's not to say that I don't have to reach out and, and work hard to, to build, to bring them all in, to, you know, to, to get people under the tent. You know, I, I absolutely mm -hmm. do have to do that, but, and I'm, and I'm working on it, but uh, you know, it, it's, it's maybe a little easier for me just in that, I, I, I have an audience of some sort, you know, right. already. And so they're already sort of predisposed to be interested in what I'm doing. What we've, um, what we've learned with doing this show is um, consistency is one of the key components to continuously build a community or an audience. Or yeah, whatever. yeah. It's you like know, anything. It's like I tell people, like, I tell uh, people ask me advice about guitar and about practicing and everything like that. I said, the key is consistency. Any to build anything, it's consistency. Do it mm -hmm. consistently mm -hmm. every day or, or whatever your schedule is you decided on and stick to it. And like, if you yeah, just, just play, make sure they don't play forget about minutes you. every day. That's way better than not playing for two weeks and then playing for nine hours one day. Mm -hmm. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Yep. You're going to get far better progress, far better results hitting it consistently 15 minutes a day and working on the things you need to work on. Right. You know, ideally you want to try to get more than 15 minutes of, you know, half hour to, to an hour. Yeah, but you got to have a starting point, point, at least if you're trying to, exactly. if you're trying to make the change and you're trying to skew in a different direction, start yeah. small. Don't, don't shoot for the big things because you're going to end up failing. And most humans that fail, once they fail, they stop. So yeah. start slow I mean, really treat it like exercise, go out and walk for 15 minutes and then come back home. Yeah, Next exactly. Day, do 16 minutes, do 17, you know, yeah. just build 1% uh, each Just day. go there and touch the touch. Someone told me just go to the gym and touch the door handle. Like, go yeah. there, like just get there first. The, the next day, the turn the handle. But <laughs> turn don't open the door. <laughs> don't open the door. <laughs> it goes back to the, to the, to the learning, you know, to play guitar analogy, which is, you know, you start slow, do a little bit every day, because that's how you're going to build your calluses and start to build some muscle memory. You know, mm -hmm. you have to you have to press those strings down. And when you're new, that hurts. It yeah. does. And uh, eventually you get where you can play all day. And it doesn't, and it doesn't hurt. Yeah, totally, yeah. dude. 
That's rad, dude. I, I love all that. And um, I want to get more into that. But James, how we usually do this on the show, we like to start as far back in your beginning as we possibly can. You know, as far back as your memory will take you to childhood when music clicked with you in some fashion. You know, you're you're doing something as a child and and you're actually realizing you're paying attention to the music more than anything else. And, you know, whatever the your parents are playing in the house. We like to hear all that kind of stuff. Well, uh, my parents were a very eclectic, you know, music listeners just at the time, not, not that they were very, uh, you know, uh, engaged in, uh, you know, cultivating music collection and listening to a broad variety of things. They just, you know, they were two different people that had different, you know, my mother was very much country. It was all mm-hmm. country and Western. My father listened to a lot of rock, you know, Any, anything from Jimi Hendrix and Pete Floyd to the, you know, like the Doobie Brothers and, you know, the Guess Who and stuff like that. Right. And, uh, you know, he also liked the country and the country and Western and he, and he played a lot of that. But, you know, he, he was he was into, you know, classic what we think of as classic rock these days. And, you know, yeah, the, you know, the Guess Who, the Who, <laughs> you know, some British stuff, so lots of American stuff, Credence, you know all the stuff you might imagine and, uh, and stuff like Elton John, like seventies Elton John and stuff like that. And all that stuff was very influential to me because it was played in the house. Totally. That's what we had. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, my dad, even in the, in the, in the mid to late seventies, especially the late seventies, he even, even went through like a disco phase. <laughs> nice. I mean, I'm, I'm sure <laughs> yeah. most people did at that time. Yeah. 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 Well I, well, I still, to this day, because of it, I have, I have such an appreciation of Nile Rogers because he was like the king of, disco guitar back then you know like ah, that's actually a name that i haven't uh heard and now i want to check it out right freak out or, or uh or oh yeah time. freak out i love that shit mm-hmm. and the all that funk guitar and shit so that, so. you know good times <laughs> hell yeah so good you know so i grew up with that that stuff playing in the house in the 70s so it was all, always influential to me killer dude so um and then you know uh did you were you born in florida no actually uh, um i probably would have been had my father not been in the service he was in the navy at the time that i was born mm. and uh he had been stationed to the norfolk naval base okay in uh, uh in virginia and because of that i was born at the hospital right there in portsmouth hmm so I was born in Portsmouth, Virginia, but I, I didn't live there very long. You know, uh, I think maybe the first three months of my life. And then my dad got rotated out of Virginia. And, and you know, uh, anyone familiar with, you know, military service and the way it works is, you know, you get your, your duty station and you go live and work there. And uh, when you when that tour is over, when that assignment is over, you usually get, you know, a nice little vacation back home. So. Uh, you know, he came back to came back to Florida, and for a while, he uh, stayed in civilian life. He uh, became a police officer and things like that. He always played guitar, though. Um, mm. He was just, you know, a strummer, you know, a strummer and a singer. You know, mm-hmm. he would just sort of strum the chords and sing the songs, and he everything from you know, old country to like old stuff, like I think possibly some of like old Elvis. All this type of stuff, things like that, and uh, some folk songs. Like I think I remember uh, he, one of his his big hits was always that song, "Alice's Restaurant." If you've never heard that, you know, don't bother. But <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it was one of my dad's go tos. Right. And, uh, you know, so he always had a guitar around. I wasn't necessarily always allowed to touch it, but he had a guitar, and uh, and uh, he taught me my very first chord. You know, he taught me how to play, you know, E major and G major, D major and like A minor and things like that. And, Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, (laughs) he taught my very first melody, (laughs) shaving a haircut, you know, (laughs) and that's kind of what got me started, you know, that and his record collection, you know, except by the late seventies, he had all this stuff, everything from like, you know, the disco stuff with Nile Rogers playing killer guitar on it. To uh, uh, you know, stuff like Doobie Brothers and and uh, Santa Esmeralda and uh, Christopher Cross, which you know people may not know, Christopher Frost, Cross was slash is because he's still alive, a ripper of a guitar player. Okay. Um, 
uh, you know, it got buried in his yacht rock, you know, they would right, yeah, yeah. Mix when he would rip a solo. But a lot of times you hear these crazy ripping solos on, on his stuff and it's, it's, it's him. Um, what makes yacht rock yacht rock? I, I don't even know don't like know. an example of yacht vibe, rock. I've just know? heard it's that. that vibe. Yeah. Hey, I did. I didn't invent the term, so I, I don't really, I don't really know. <laughs> yeah, I just, but, I, uh, I don't know. I've never heard any real examples fun. of what it is, but I've heard the term, you know. Yeah, well, Christopher Cross would be a, a prime example of, of okay. what people are talking about when they use the 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 term yacht rock. Right on. It's like pre butt rock. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> Well, cool. So, all right. So, the, all that's that's uh, happening at home. And what age was it where you're seeing Dad strum guitar? Was it Dad that made you decide? Well, I, I, I just asked too? him to show me to show me how to play, you know, some chords and stuff. And so he did. He still didn't really let me touch his guitar. So, from about age eight, I started asking for a guitar. Yeah. I wanted my own guitar that I could play and that I could have in my room and and. And I mean, every birthday, every Christmas, every opportunity that there was a time when, when I was going to get any kind of gift, I was just, I just want a guitar. Just a guitar. That was the top it of the It could be list. my birthday and Christmas. I don't care. Just, I want a guitar. Wow. But it, they never got me one. Oh, shit. My mom eventually got me an acoustic for high school graduation. Um, mm. But I started playing before that. Uh, by my sophomore year, I think. Sophomore or junior year. Junior year. My father let me start to take because, it, you know, by then I, we were living in Germany. My my dad was stationed in uh, Germany, actually for the second time, and so I lived a total of six years in Germany as a kid. Actually, started playing guitar in Germany seriously, and uh, you know, formed my you know was in my first band in Germany, and all of that. Wow. And uh, uh, you know, so if you go back to you know, it would be about 1983 or something, and uh, I. Uh, I wanted a guitar, of course. He, but I, I, I was going to Frankfurt American High School. There was, a, there, there was at the time an entire network of American schools, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went to Frankfurt American High School, and uh, they actually had a guitar. Excuse me, they actually had a guitar class, and uh, so I enrolled in that class. And uh, my dad uh, let me take his guitar to school, and wow. and take that class with it, which was. That was pretty cool because he was always so, I mean, you would think it was some kind of crazy valuable, you know, because it was a classical guitar. It was a nylon string classical. Was guitar. it the same? It was the same guitar since you were a kid? Yeah. It was wow. always the same one. He, he only ever had that one guitar. And uh, uh, so he finally let me take it by the time I was, you know, like a junior in high school to, wow. uh, to school with me and uh, practice guitar uh, for my class. And, uh, Mostly that class was, you know, the teacher taught us out of Mel Bay book one, which is where you mm -hmm. had you know, learn how to play the melody like Mary had a little lamb or whatever. It's yep. really, really lame and really dumb. But even the teacher knew it, but she had to do it. She had to teach out of it to follow the, you know, the curriculum. And uh, but she would just let us do our work really quick. And then she'd let us just group up in a in a circle in the back of the room and just play guitar. So you're she in Germany, were you guys, she, were you yeah, she would read like or whatever, didn't care. Were you <laughs> playing like Scorpions and stuff? Because you're in Germany, and the Scorpions are probably like the biggest band out there, right? No, not at all, man. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Joel. That's like thinking, I don't know, like Menudo's the biggest band in Mexico. It's not, you know, it's not. <laughs> well, that was no, wrong. I mean, yeah, yeah, Germany was big. They're, I mean, the Scorpions were, were big there, of course. They're, but they're because they were big everywhere. Yeah. Um, but no, you know, I was... Uh, no, I actually did pretty well in school. Um, I didn't have I want, to try that hard. I had a I had um, a quick question for you, James, because you were saying that you you graduated or you were going to high school in Germany, and you know your dad was stationed here, here, and here. How many times did you go to different schools as a child? A lot. A yeah. lot. I, I never counted it up, but it was a lot. But really, just before before I lose my thread of what I was saying, I think sorry, I'm, I'm a little bit afraid I might already have. What was I saying? <laughs> Uh, well, scorpions, but... scor uh, being in yeah. Germany. Well, you know, advance warning, fellas. I'm I'm one of the olds now. So, yeah. <laughs> if you interrupt my chain of thought, I'm. I'm sorry, dude. I, 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 yeah, I <laughs> no, do that you know, constantly on this. Anthony's thing, Anthony's we'll Italian learn. comes out. We'll learn one day. <laughs> That's what we have the chat for. What was he saying? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <I know>. Exactly. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, 
Fuck. Uh, sorry. No, no, it's okay. Um, it's 10 seconds. Uh, you know, I, I did really well in school. And because of that, I was able to, my teachers really liked me. I would come in, I would do my work so fast. I'd get it done. I never did homework home because I did it at school as fast as I could because I valued my free time. And, mm. uh, and what I used that free time to do was skip school <laughs> at least <laughs> twice a week. And uh, I would, I would uh, uh, just walk right off campus and go hop on an U-Bahn, which is the uh, the German subway system. And uh, I would take the U-Bahn to, uh, to the Hauptbahnhof or, or to, to the uh, Hauptwache and uh, you know, go to a, a number of uh, German uh, record stores and music stores. And, uh, you know, I'd play guitars, I'd go buy records, and do whatever, you know, nice. <laughs> whatever I'd save my little, you know, Rather. More money up and 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 I, I was buying you know in the in the early to mid 80s i was buying just a crazy amount of records and i uh, was gonna ask you what was like one of the uh prime examples of relics well, that you were a, a really you... good example is uh uh one of the things that me and chuck Schuldiner ultimately bonded on quite a bit when we when we, the, in our first conversation uh, before I ever joined the band, which was uh, early 80s French heavy metal, like Sortilege and H-Bomb. I had those records because I had bought them in Germany. And uh, and the first time me and Chuck talked, you know, those records came up. And I think that made a, a connection. He's like, okay, I I see eye to eye with this guy about something, you know. So it, it sort of, I think it sort of paved the way to him thinking of me when... Uh, you know, when they had the opening. Killer. Um, so yeah, bought all those records there and st bands like trance and, uh, uh, picture. What know? could you relate like the style of those bands to you? Like what would, what's short like, or what's trance like? Oh man, it's sort of just melodic, uh, heavy metal. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know? <laughs> yeah. Very, very French. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very, very, very French. Um, what year would that uh, yeah, be German, that you would be buying this? Like, like, like trance were awesome. They they kind of sounded like a like scorpions. And I remember when I discovered Accept there. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, mm -hmm. I discovered quite a bit of stuff there. You know, I'm like, I I discovered Creator and Destruction and and Sodom and all that stuff while I was there. And these are all this is your high school years, right? Mm -hmm. So um, while you're in high school, are you meeting like minded guys that are? or gals absolutely they skipped stuff. school with me <laughs> we went together usually mm -hmm. so and and were and it was school was it for specifically military kids yeah yeah okay so depend then you were you were you, still coming you. across other american children and yeah yeah, yeah. i mean my my uh, high school frankfurt american high school i think the student body was 1100 wow wow damn so it was it was quite a bit quite a mm. bit yeah definitely yeah so okay, and then at what time do you come back to the states in life? Um, uh, you know, shortly after graduation, you know, and uh, like I, I had played in my first band, which was just we got together basically for a variety show. I think we played like three songs. I don't even remember, you know, what all they were. They weren't particularly heavy. I think an old Death Leopard song, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> something from probably. Um, uh, you know, one of their first couple albums, you know, before Pyromania, before the pop days. The blowout um, stuff, yeah. Yeah, like On Through the Night or something like that. Um, and, uh, you know, we played this variety show. And uh, that was my very first band. Then I, then I came back and uh, I decided to stay in Florida uh, with my mother when uh, when my dad went to, got stationed to uh, Louisiana. But that didn't last long. I ended up in Louisiana anyway, and uh, mm. and you know was doing some of my first uh, civilian jobs. I say civilian jobs because uh, to, in order to buy my first guitar that I ever bought, which was not this one, <laughs> but uh, when I bought my very first guitar, I was still in Germany, and I and you know because my dad would never buy me one, I I had to wait until I was old enough to work in the. Uh, 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 Department of Defense Dependent Youth Employment Program. Whoa. So Mouthful. if you're over there in a place, in, you know, in a place like Germany, the, the the DOD used to have this program to put 
dependent youth of at least six, you know, 15, 16 years old, I think, um, you had to be at least, the, they put you to work <laughs> somewhere on base, you know, doing something. And uh, so two years in a row, I worked as, an, as a, a helper to the main maintenance guy for the Geeson Military Base uh, Non-Commissioned Officers Club, NCO Club. And uh, his name was Franz, and he looked like Schneider from All in the Family. Uh, <laughs> or, or, not All in the Family. Sorry, Schneider from... Uh, Oh man, I don't remember even the name of the show now. Uh, you know, me, me and Anthony laughed like we knew. We giggle. We giggle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is way before like, this, is, this sounds like a punchline. An old, an old '70s sitcom. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, 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 I was able to save my money to get my very first guitar, and I just I remember when I finally got that that last paycheck that put me over the edge. I knew I was going to be able to afford a guitar, and I I took uh, 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 the bus, which the you know the the U S military provided from our housing area in booth in Bootsbach was the name of the town. I lived, uh, I went to school in Frankfurt, lived in Bootsbach and the nearest big town to me to Bootsbach was Gießen. And, uh, so I took a bus over to Gießen, went to a little German music shop that I knew about that I had found out about there and, uh, went in and bought my very first guitar and, uh, wow. That's my very first, uh, distortion pedal, which was an Ibanez tube screamer, a TS nine. Oh, nice. And uh, I, I didn't manage to hold on to that one, unfortunately. But my very next one was a TS-10 Tube Screamer that, was, I, that I got to replace that. And I did hold on to that one. I actually still have it to this day. It's around here somewhere. It's, you know, well over 30 years old. It's 30 some odd years old. Going on probably 40 years old. And uh, um, I was still, I used it on every single album that I played on. No uh, shit. Up to and including the gathering. Wow! Nice. So, tu so tube screamers. So they were just clean boosts instead of like an actual distortion pedal. So you're you're boosting kind of, and you already had distortion in your amp or something. Yeah, the amp already had distortion. So what you do with the tube screamers, you get a little bit of extra bite. I didn't do it totally clean because you first of all, the tube screamer is not really all that. You you can kind of approximate a clean boost with it. Turn the gain down, obviously. Turn the yeah. volume up, but. Uh, um, you know, they do a little something even with the gain all the way off. They do a little something. They do a little something to the signal even if the pedal's off, which normally is not a good thing. But, you know, a lot of amps people were using for metal back in the day had kind of flabby low end, like mm -hmm. rectifiers and old Marshall. You know, the, the low end could get a little loose. Rect so the dual rectifiers up, yeah. in particular were kind of notorious for a flabby low end. Yep. You just throw a tube screamer on there and it just tighten it right up. Yep. You know, and uh, yeah, that's why it became such a popular pedal. But yeah, but I would I would have the gain up at around probably, you know, like uh, if it were a clock face, it would be like 10 or 11, you know, uh, a clock, you know, and uh, uh, usually the uh, the, the uh, tone, which is sort of like your little EQ, I usually sort of had that somewhere just off center of the middle, depending on what I was doing, it would be either cutting or boosting a little bit and uh you know the uh, volume was probably up around like one o'clock or two o'clock on a clock yep. face and uh uh that you know it just really would tighten up the sound it would add, because i had the gain you know up a bit it was uh it added some bite it added some sustain it added some you know mm -hmm. some nice little singing to, to, so i would step on that for uh for solo sometimes you know nice, sometimes I definitely. For, you know with the rectifiers i found myself using it all the time because of the mm -hmm. flabby low end of the dual rectifiers. Actually, one question I did want to ask now, I mean, you brought it up in the very beginning, not to go too off in the weeds, but you're, you were talking about your tremolo system and the one you just installed. What's the difference between the yeah, specific gear talk? Well, uh, what's, what's the, the deal with that bridge? And I've never even heard of that. I mean, I've heard of a Kaler, I've heard of a Floyd Rose. I've heard of, yeah, th th you know, this is, yeah. uh, I don't, I'm not really sure how long the company has been around. They're not terribly old company, but mm -hmm. they have mastered this thing. It's called, the Vega Trim VT1 Ultra Trim, and uh, it is a, a, a replacement for Strats and Strat style guitars. Oh, okay, so it fits is, there. See, it fits in the Strat. Can you see yeah. the cavity? You see yeah, the cavity? Yeah. Yep. You see how its form fits that cavity? Perfect. Yep. Well, definitely. On a on a regular Stratocaster bridge, it extends beyond the cavity, so you don't really get any pull up because it just hits the body. Oh, gotcha. To get any, yeah. you have to kind of set the bridge jacked up where it's kind of sticking at a crazy angle up in the yeah. air so that you can pull up a little bit. 
And that just feels uncomfortable to play and your hands always hitting it and mushing you out yeah. of tune and all of that. You really yeah. want your, your, your bridge to be level, you know? Yep. Definitely. Uh, and, uh, Definitely. Like, like, like that, you know? And, uh, mm-hmm. But like I said, you know, the traditional uh, Stratocaster bridges, whether it's the six screw type or the the two point variety, uh-huh. um, they, uh, you know, they extend beyond the cavity. So you don't really get any pull up. Gotcha. And, uh, but this is designed to fit tuck right into that cavity. And you can you can see right there. Oh, yeah, yeah. Pull up and it, it tucks right into the cavity. cavity. That's awesome. So I get like a full. Like that's a minor third. Uh-huh. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah you got the same up. Floyd kind of thing. It's like a Floyd rose. Yeah, yeah, you can pull up, and 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 the, the really great thing about this, besides just how well it works, how great it feels, so how cool. well it's made, is that it doesn't require any modification to your guitar at all. There's yeah. no locking tune, no locking nut at all. It's and it just, stays in tune pretty well. Stays in tune really well. Like I was just yanking on it. Let me. And you play those type of chords, you know, if you're out of tune, you'll hear it right away. You know? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Definitely. So, uh, uh, yeah, it stays in tune really, really well. And, Is that a Hetfield uh, EMG? Uh, well, it's a 57. Oh, the 57. Uh, okay, okay. Got it. I know that the, the original Het set was uh, uh, an 81 in the bridge. I okay. think he might have a set that he does these days that has a 57 in the bridge. So, yeah, that's a that's an EMG 57 in the bridge. It's the uh, EMG SA in the middle position. Single quote, yeah. And the EMG uh, SLV, which is Steve Lukather's signature model. Oh, wow. Neck cool. Interesting. Setup. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and I got the, uh, I think, do I have a push pull on that? Is there a boost or is there yeah, just a single not. coil? Yeah, I think I had them eliminate that when I had this. I had this. Business. I got you. But but uh, uh, yeah, no, it's they're they're, they're uh, you know this is a pretty a reasonably hot single coil. So I mean, when you're when you were younger, you said your dad wouldn't let you touch the guitar and stuff. What kind of guitar did he have? I'm sure you remember. It was just a nylon string classical. Acoustic. Okay, it's a nylon. Okay, just like yeah, that. okay, yeah. yeah and yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, you know, he he put it in the closet, and I wasn't really allowed to touch it, but. Trust me, you know, <laughs> I also wasn't allowed to touch his record player, but, you know, I knew yeah. when he got home and we were on the third floor of an apartment building and I could see right out the big picture window you got when time. he pulled up. So I'd have his guitar out. I had records spinning on the t- <laughs> and At the time I'd see his car, I, I had enough time. No worries. I'd have <laughs> yeah. that guitar in the closet, a record put away, everything turned down. I was like, well, hopefully he doesn't come over and put his hand on the amp, you know, because you the amplifier of the stereo system was, you know, but he never did. <laughs> He never did. Yeah. My dad would actually have same thing. He, was, he had like really, he's a bass player, like really expensive basses, but he would have them set up in a, in a way that if they were moved just a little bit, he would, he would set like traps for me and he would know that they were like, I would, I'd fuck with the stuff. He'd be like, well, you messing with my bass? I'm like, no, what are you talking about? It's like back in the, I like buffed it, everything, but I made that I one mistake. like my dad in the way he used to do that. Like if he, if I wasn't supposed to go in a room or something like that, because like, you know, one of the things he was was uh, uh, his his what they call MOS mode of service. Yeah. Uh, what he did in the military was he was uh, uh, a military police investigator, and okay, as such, okay. he, he as such he was issued handguns. Yep. And he sometimes you know he would have them at home when he was uh, you know and Sam was he'd my out and out doing something else. Yep. And uh, he would. Uh, uh, he would rig little traps to see if I was fooling with his stuff, trying to, <laughs> you know, as I was a kid, I was, you know, I was a young kid. I was interested in all of that. No, he got me with that too. He had a shotgun in his, in his <laughs> closet and he had it angled a certain way. And I just like, was like one day I was like, I just need to hold it for a second. <laughs> you know? Like, it's like, I knew it was such a thing that you were not supposed to touch. So I was like, well, I'm, I have to touch it now. You know, it's like a, I know. a kid yeah. move. you know, it's like, you gotta go fuck with yeah, it. Yeah. It's you know? guaranteed. You tell, you tell, <laughs> you know, I, you know, not being a girl myself, I have no idea whether this applied to girls, but I, I know just from me and my friends and everyone uh-huh. I've ever talked to in adult life, as as young boys, dad told us not to oh. mess with something. That's exactly what we were going to Locked in. That's exactly. It's gone. on your radar. <laughs> that's on your radar now. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't fuck with my shit, and as soon as we can, dude, I'm digging through it. Dude. So Anthony <laughs> broke his headphones, it looks like. Yeah, <laughs> I did. <laughs> put him, I put them down on the desk, and then I... 
I, I, I kicked the cord with one foot and simultaneously stepped oh. down on the other one in one fluid motion. And nice. so I have broken headphones now. And I tried to go uh, on the computer speakers, but I was like, oh, shit, it might like echo, echo you know? Yeah, yeah. So I'm just going to have to fucking sit like this. Dude, my <laughs> life is just fucking. You're wild. like looking <laughs> and then one. <laughs> it's so funny. Dude. Oh, dude. What I have to go through every single week to get this shit going, dude. <laughs> <sighs> oh man but i still love it guys i really do i swear all the audio listeners it looks like he's like djing with like with a broken but it looks head. like he's like, like a <laughs> weird like holding the headphones like one two one it's a ear. broken there's a broken side is facing out so it looks like a j kind of sticking yeah. out of it i mean yeah. for the people listening people can see it you think. i mean i can do it like <laughs> thing back on your head somehow you can flap that back. oh yeah there you go Oh go. shit! It actually, <laughs> I just like threw it on there and it stayed. I tried to do it like this before. It's gonna, I can feel the right ones creeping off the ear. <laughs> you could have a toupee, but it's fine. It's like, you have like plastic hair. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> sorry, like, James. Like I, Devo again, hair. I'm derailing things. <laughs> yeah, get some duct tape. Yeah, just tape <laughs> it around your head. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, I can feel it now. It's sitting literally. I gotta like keep my ears perked up to like hold it. You know? Yeah, yeah. yeah no, you got it. You'll be fine. But oh, so back back on the. I mean, so you're going back. Were you ever jamming like in band, like full fledged bands in Germany, or that didn't happen until you got back to the states? Yeah, yeah. My very first band. You know, w what we used to do was uh, we'd get together and uh, in order to rehearse, it, it was kind of a cool situation because you could just go down to the base. We, we could get on base. We had our military IDs. So we could go right on base, and you could go to the rec centers. Mm. Oh, and gotcha. In the rec centers, they always had rooms that you could use you just signed up for it you know like hey yeah. i want to use this room and they tell you like okay you yeah you can use that room and you can you know you can use it until this time mm -hmm. and so we just and they man they had amps there they had instruments there they had everything wow you That's know awesome. we would of course bring our own uh stuff but it, you know, there was always stuff there and uh and you know because of this you know we we, we sometimes jammed with you know some young gis and you know things like that you know because they were always there at the rec center and uh so that's that's what we did and uh you know we practiced and we eventually played that uh variety show <laughs> the high school variety show oh yeah and, like uh, uh, oh, we, yeah. you know we played our we played our little cover songs and, and that was it that's all we did and then then my dad uh was rotated back to the states and that's when i met my old buddy mike rizzo who uh um, still plays guitar to this day. He plays an Iron Maiden tribute band um, still, I think, to this day. But um, you know, well, we before together, we move on from that, James, before Pardon? we move on, sorry, before we move on from that, I want to know, so you did the variety show. When you got up on stage, was it an exhilarating experience to where when you came back to the States, you're like, I want to I experience that again? Well, um, the, 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 the very surprising massive applause when we were done i mean as far as i know looking back on it maybe they were just that glad we were done <laughs> <laughs> but it it erupted and that was a good feeling everything right, up yeah. until that moment was nerve-wracking or yeah. terrifying <laughs> right yep yep definitely. so i don't remember the, the aggravation was that uh you know and th this this is a funny thing because this was in germany and this was 1984 and the name of our band was Assassin. Mm. We we didn't know that there was a German band in Essen named Assassin. Maybe they uh. didn't even exist yet. And I'm quite sure that the the German band Assassin never heard of this little <laughs> band of American kids who right. played a couple cover songs at a high school variety show once. Yeah. Um, <laughs> they never heard of us, you know. So, but uh, yeah, my first band was called Assassin. It was in Germany, and I remember being so irritated that, <laughs> that yeah. the, the woman who introduced us she asked us what's the name of your band and we said assassin mm -hmm. and she said assassin okay cool and then she goes out and says please welcome the assassins and i go oh, 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 oh. <laughs> damn it <laughs> we are not a group assassins. of assassins we, we are all up. in one as one assassin yeah yeah <laughs> yeah yeah and uh so you know i was irritated and then all of a sudden i realized i had to play and so that, then i got scared you know? yeah yeah and then you know and, I, and I, i'm quite sure that i probably played a few clunkers 
you know, right off the bat. But mm -hmm. then we got into the groove of it. All the practice kicked in. And then when we were done, as awful as it probably was, the place erupted in applause. And that's, uh, great, dude. That, and got... that's when the good feeling hit me. And I was just like, mm. I got that? a new drug. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the bug got dude. you. The bug, the, the playing shows bug got you. That's cool. So you yeah. went back. So you weren't playing any originals. It was all covers. So you got back to the States. Did you start grouping and together Mike, with your was friend Mike, Mike friend Rizzo? That... Yeah, I was yeah, going to say, was Rizzo a friend? friend? He still is. He's still a friend of mine. And uh, uh, Before you uh, went to but, Germany, too? No, no. I met, oh, him, okay. in, I met him in Louis, at Fort Polk, Louisiana, where my, which was my dad's next duty station. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was only, I, I didn't live there very long. I was, you know, out of high school and I, you know, was needing to get my life started. And I just didn't, I didn't really want to do it in Louisiana. You know? Yeah, good call. Uh, I mean... <laughs> I mean, the biggest, the only town real nearby Fort Polk is this little podunk place called Leesville. It's nothing. It's a nothing burger. That, you know, no, 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 uh, no, no offense to anyone that might happen to be listening from Leesburg, but uh, uh, I'm sure you will agree. It's not, yeah, it's, it's not a major metropolitan area. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, we we just played covers. We, me and me and Mike, you know, we we did everything. We did Judas Priest, Iron Maiden, Metallica. We even had some hair band stuff in there, like Rat and, mm -hmm. and what have you. And we did Loudness. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, yeah, we yeah. Did... So this is what like <laughs> eighty five or something. You're saying eighty four was in Germany. So is this eighty five? This was eighty five, and yeah, this was eighty five. Okay, nice. Yeah. So you got you got Mike Rizzo, the homie, and you guys are jamming and all that stuff. Do you, who's the one who comes with the first extreme metal record to the group and says, "Well, Dude, uh, me, like Slayer or something." At that time, I already had those records. I, you know, I had bought them in Germany. You know, uh -huh. so you know, so you now, already came across Slayer and all that stuff in Germany. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Nice. Yeah. Absolutely. As soon as they came out, I was aware of them as soon as they came out. You know, I mean, believe me, they were being pushed really hard in the German magazines. You know? Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you know, it, 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 you know? <laughs> so now was was so, Rizzo uh, keen on that stuff when you came back to the States, too? Or were you? Well, I'll just say this. Stuff? I remember I think he liked Slayer pretty quick. I think he was really into Slayer pretty quick. But I remember when I very first played him. um I played him creator mm. and uh, I remember setting this, Yo, dude, you're going to love this. These guys are so cool. And I put it down and it started off, you know, track one, I think of uh, it was, uh, it was the song riot of violence, right. of violence. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And he was just like, what is he said? <laughs> right. Riot of violence. He said, it sounds like waka waka. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, from then on, he was just like, Oh, don't, were you gonna every time I it was my turn to play music, he said, oh, "Don't play that Waka Waka band." <laughs> <laughs> the Waka Waka band, that's awesome. Yeah, dude. yeah, but uh, but you know, my you know, I think Mike you know, really loves Creator these days. But uh, back yeah. then, he didn't know about him, and and it just sounded like Waka Waka to him. That's that, a, was, that's a common a thing player. we've talked about on the show. Joel's been through it. A bunch of people have been through it. But yeah. It, if if you're not ready for it, it does sound like waka waka when you hear it. You know, yeah. You come from but, like normal, like I mean, maybe like more aggressive, like yeah. You listen to butt rock vocals, then you go to a more of aggressive style, and you're like, like Chris Barnes fuck? come across your <laughs> your attention. You're like, this is waka waka. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I love that. That's the first time I've heard that, and now I've already said it twice. It's going to be part of my vernacular. Wait till, wait till you listen to Ride of Ounce. <laughs> <laughs> I might even put it on right now in the background. <laughs> so that's, all right. So, oh, no. so eighty-five, you guys are you got you guys are still covering. I want to know uh, who's the first person that comes with their own original riff. In that band, uh, you know, we would play riffs for each other just in personally. You know what I mean? And you know, yeah. most of mine were kind of at that time, kind of you know what used to be called speed metal 
Mm-hmm. Slayer was considered speed metal. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's what people called them. You know, no right. one called them death metal or or any or thrash. Or thrash or even. It was all speed, speed metal. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so I I was I was probably the the one among us that was busting out speed metal riffs. And uh, I think you know Mike was probably at that time doing a little bit more traditional heavy metal, melodic heavy metal type of stuff. Mm-hmm. And he, how he long does it, great at that stuff. how long do you guys as a unit go forward from that point? Oh, I, I would say it was probably less than a year. We played, uh, I think maybe two bar gigs on mm. on Fort Polk. Yeah, um, you know, a, for a public, you know, this is, you know, I don't know how un PC it's allowed to get around here. <laughs> <laughs> go for Bring it. it. But there was a. Uh, 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 a bar called uh the three sisters and that it, right there in leesville and we played the the gigs that i played with him there playing the covers mm-hmm. was right was at that bar the three sisters and it had it had the picture of three sisters you know the on the sign outside and it ended like just below you know just below their rib cages you know yeah mm-hmm. and so mm-hmm. we used to call it the six titties <laughs> <laughs> Man, let's go play six titties <laughs> Oh, dude, what are you doing tonight, dude? Uh, just, uh, head down to the six titties, dude. Yeah, that's all any of us on. ever called it. We never called it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Nothing else going on, dude. Just yeah. pick out six now, titties. Yeah, and I, I just decided to get out of there. You know, I was just like, you know, I want, I want to go live in Florida. There's a scene happening there. There's bands popping up there. You know, like my my like one of my favorite bands. I was like, I've got to get there so I can see sabotage, man. You know, I was all. Real quick, let's just show James how PC the show is. Pull up uh, Ian's. Uh... <laughs> he says, I, w- I would have called it nine holes. <laughs> <laughs> That's how PC the show is, James. Yeah. But you guys know that, you know, Power of the Night? <laughs> that sounds familiar. Oh, that sounds yeah, yeah. Power of the Night out. So Hell great. yeah. And, oh, yeah. uh, uh, you know, I wanted to get there and, and Nasty Savage and Death, you know, uh, I, I wanted, you know, well, uh, at the time, you know, I think they may have still been called Mantis at the time. But, uh, you know, I was a tape trader and, uh, you know, because of my time in Germany, I, I, I was early in the game of trading with people from Europe, you know. Right. Uh, uh, and uh, well versed. Yeah. Yeah. So I recognized through fanzines and everything like that, that, you know, Hey, my, my mother lives, you know, in our drive from where most of this stuff is happening in either direction, either Orlando or Tampa, you know, mm-hmm. and you know, so she lived right there in, in Lakeland, you know, pretty much. So, wow. I came back and, uh, moved into my mom's and I started, uh, uh, you know, just practicing my butt off mm-hmm. and, you know, working in a warehouse and practicing my butt off. So and eventually I got, a, you know, decent enough and well-versed enough and stuff to, uh, I, remember I, I remember I went into a, a local music store called Carlton music and I was playing and, uh, the, the guy just said, Hey, you're pretty good. Uh, you ever thought about teaching? And I was like, huh, what does it pay? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, you know, and he just kind of went into it with me and I was like, yeah, sure. I'll do that. <laughs> so. <laughs> I ended up teaching there for a couple of years, up, right up until uh, I uh, got the gig in Agent Steel, actually. Mm. So talk a, about a, that. So Agent Steel. So what? what well, what? Um, you know, I had uh, been, you know, going back and forth to Tampa for a while. I had been trying to audition for bands, and because uh, you know, I I was teaching guitar, I was practicing my butt off, and were you yeah, writing at all? I did too? with my time. Pardon? Were you writing at all too? Yeah, I was. I was writing riffs. I, I had mm-hmm. a collection of riffs, probably on my little boombox cassette deck. You know, <laughs> just, that right. was as advanced as I was with it. Um, I, I wasn't jamming with anybody, so it was really hard to fully flesh out a song. Um, I figured out how to do it by the time I was writing material for Disincarnate a few years later. But um, initially, there, you know, well, probably about five years later from then, but. Uh, yeah, I just wrote riffs. I, I wouldn't say that I had at that point had written any complete songs. Right. Um, I actually wrote my first complete song in that band, and mm. uh, but uh, I'll get to that. Uh, 
I used to go part of, part of my routine to find bands to audition for was to drive into Tampa to a music store that was called Thoroughbred Music, and it was a uh, it was the place to go, and I used mm-hmm. to go there all the time. And I, I remember I remember lots of crazy stories happened in there. Like I remember the time I was in there, and I you know I had already been to see Morbid Angel live. You know I had seen them play like at, in Brandon and and in Tampa. And uh, mm-hmm. so when I when I ran into uh, Richard Burnell in there, I recognized him, and I was just, "Hey, Richard, what's up?" And he's, "Oh, hey, dude." I think mean, he recognized me from a show or something. And it was you got know, people don't understand about these shows; they were small, right? You know, yeah, small little places. And if you if you were persistent and went up and talked to the band and stuff like that, they remembered you because they hadn't done anything at that point. They they could still retain your face. Right, right. <laughs> oh yeah, there's James so, from the last. So he remembered show, me. He's yeah. like, "Oh, hey, dude, what's up?" And he goes, "Oh," and I was like, "Yeah, man, what's up with you?" And he goes, "Oh, we just finished our, we just finished our uh, our, our debut album, man. It's coming out on Gork Records, and uh, <laughs> you want to hear it, man? I got it out in my car on tape. So went out to his car, <laughs> and uh, he threw the cassette in and played me what, what you know, Abominations of Desolation. And I didn't yeah. end up coming out." Um, for another few years, um, because they ended up getting David Vincent in the band, retooling the songs and retooling the album, and signing right. the earache and coming out with uh, you know, Alters of Madness as their debut album instead. And then, then you know, everyone knows that that album did eventually. Abominations came out mm-hmm. later as sort of like mm-hmm. a, hey, this was a thing we did. The precursor. In the past. Yeah. Check it out. And uh, 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 yeah, yeah, I just remember those riffs. Yeah, loved all, loved all that stuff. Hell yeah. So, uh, okay, so. Oh, yeah, but anyway, yeah, oh, I would go to Thoroughbred. I lost, I lost the thread of why I was talking about Thoroughbred. <laughs> oh, so you I, 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 I went to Thoroughbred to uh, look at their bulletin board. Bulletin boards were a thing, you know? It, they had a massive bulletin board in there. And uh, I had you know, answered a number of ads out of that bullet board off that bullet board and had gone and tried out for bands and I never got any of them. You know, I just kept like, Oh yeah, you know, yeah, you play. Okay. But you, you don't really have the image we're looking for. We're looking for, you know, that was a big thing. So image, I was letting yeah. my hair grow, but it was, it was not quite really long yet, you know, mm-hmm. but I was letting it grow. And, uh, I don't know what happened. I don't know whether eventually my hair got long enough or I got good enough, but <laughs> what, what, what day, I saw an ad that said, you know, combat records band re- relocated from California looking for, you know, Florida, you know, guitarists to, to, you know, come on board and, you know, and, and, uh, uh, you know, Europe, you know, we got a European tour, you know, booked that's coming up and, you know, our new album is about to drop and, uh, it did not identify who the band was, but it, it had, you know, that thing we used to, we used to do back in the day where you, you take the bottom part of the flyer, you'd mark it off into little strips. And, and then, then cut them. Cut those strips with scissors, and each each little strip could be easily torn off, and it yep. had the phone number written on it. Mm-hmm. And that's the way you'd get the phone number off a flyer. You just peel off one of the tabs. Right. Well, you know, I was just like, "Holy shit!" Combat Records band, man, like death is on Combat Records. Whoa. I yeah. It's probably not death because that's not from you know they had been in California. Hmm. Who could it be? You know. Yeah. And uh, so uh, uh, I. I took the whole damn flyer. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, this is my gig. Piece, you know? <laughs> Fuck all you guys. Thing. You get all the tabs. Screw, screw everybody else. And uh, <laughs> but I, you know, I called it and I and I spoke. Ended up speaking to uh, a young lad named Richard Bateman, mm. and he oh, had been yeah. chosen to be the bass player. Yeah. And uh, uh, w- people, you know, w- w- with enough background knowledge of the Florida scene, might recognize Richard Bateman as for many years being the bass player of nasty savage that's what he went on to do after this but he had been chosen uh to be the bass player and they were still looking for a guitar player it was the singer and drummer and and whatnot that had come from california and they were looking for a bass player and guitar player and they found richard and then the number that i called was actually richard and richard arranged for me to have an audition so i came down and i that's they revealed to me that it was agent steel and their album unstoppable force was going to be dropping in a, in a couple of months on, on uh, combat. And that in, you know, right after that was scheduled a European tour to support it. And they needed somebody like right then to start learning the songs and practicing. And so, um, uh, I, I jammed a little bit, you know, for them there, just playing, just playing, because I didn't know any of their songs yet. 
they gave me a tape of the of the new album and i have to say that that tape because you know i i i had already had um uh <clears throat> uh their their very first album which i'm for some reason i'm brain farting on the name Martin. of it and i and i went out and got mad locust rising the ep that they had and uh uh, but they gave me the uh, an advanced cassette of Unstoppable Force, and that cassette, man, that thing really was a a motivating factor for me because the guitar mm -hmm. player that they had left behind in California, the guy who I was going to have to replace, and they wanted me to play those solos exactly like the album as much as I could. Right, and uh, that was Bernie Versailles, and that mm -hmm. dude was a, a monster player back then. Okay, mm -hmm. I've heard uh, that name before. What can you? I was going to say the last name sounds familiar. Well, more recently, and you know, in more recent decades, he's he was associated with the band Redemption. Okay, he's in that band, and uh, he he had been sick up until recently. I I don't know if he's recovered, but mm. uh, he he had some medical issues for which he was going to have require a lengthy recovery, and I'm not really sure. I need to check up on that. I, I need to ask Juan Garcia. You know, who oh, you yeah. might know from. From a uh, uh, body count, but oh, by oh, that, he wrong was one, uh, wrong in one. Uh, Agent Steel, and he was in Evil Dead, okay. and uh, he was he was the other guitar player in Agent Steel with Bernie, and uh, I'm, I'm good friends with Juan. I've known him for for years and years, but uh, uh, Bernie was just a monster player, and his solos on that album, man, I really had to bust my hump to learn those. Man, it was it was I was taken to the woodshed by those solos. Nice, and uh, dude. it helped propel me mm -hmm. to be able to play what I played, to, 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 to even have the chops to be able to approach joining a band like Death and playing what I ended up playing on Spiritual Healing. That's... I don't sound anything like Bernie, no. um, but his chops were so advanced compared to mine that by virtue of learning his stuff, it it brought my chops up. So I think, I think that we all need those kinds of people, those colleagues or peers that you, you get close enough to respect one. And then two, you see that they are further ahead of you, however further ahead they are, but they're obviously in your eyes further ahead. So you see that you don't want to be, not only you don't want to be the one left behind, but then there becomes this like healthy competition of like, I'm going to, I'm going to try and pass you up type. Oh, deal, yeah, yeah. You Dude, know, um, I've never even met Bernie in person. And, oh, okay. Uh, but, uh, he, but was, you understand uh, what I'm saying, you know, it's, no, it's, it's absolutely. still a peer in a the wedge. sense that, he, yeah, these people act as a wedge for you, mm -hmm. you know, yep. to help push you through. Right, uh, uh, choke points that you may be at, mm -hmm. and I, I, I think I might have been at a little bit of a choke point there where I, I had advanced quite a bit. I was good enough to get the gig mm -hmm. without having even learned those solos yet, but by virtue of learning those solos as best I could, um, it really advanced me. Like I said, it didn't, it didn't make me sound like Bernie. I didn't play like him, um, but uh, it absolutely gave me a. Uh, you know a drive a, a, yeah yeah and it was just like a chops you know master class really you know right and, and uh, that wasn't uh, the first and only time you came across that too i'm sure in your career yeah, you yeah, know yeah. you get well you know those I, I, wedges. I love Bernie to this day he's still a he's still a great player um and uh you know a nice guy um i, I, I think i've spoke to him a little bit but mm -hmm. i've never met him in person oh wow uh, yeah. So, but uh, you know, you asked me about oh, you know, when did I write a song that like uh, they wanted to write as we were preparing for that European tour? You know, we were playing, um, you know, the first album, the 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 Mad Looks Rising EP, and uh, songs off the new one, and a healthy dose of the songs off of Unstoppable Force, and uh, but they wanted to write and perform a new track on the tour, and. Uh, so I, I, I just started writing it right there in rehearsal. Mm -hmm. Let me see if I remember.
Oh, hell, I can't remember it now. It's all good. Something like that. I don't know. It was very speed metal -y, you know. Right, right. Not, yeah. not a great song. Not, you know, it was probably it was the first song I ever wrote by myself. And uh, trust me, I screwed it up. I screwed it up real bad live. <laughs> and there's a recording of that still going around. And don't you dare play it. <laughs> I will track you down individually <laughs> and make your lives living hell. <laughs> Oh shit! So okay, so how long did now? Okay, that section of your life with Agent Steel, how long did that last? Well, I, I decided ra very quickly, I, you know, after I was got associated with. I mean, I almost quit. I walked out before the tour. Really, I walked out of a rehearsal in. I don't know, like I don't remember where we were, like Clearwater or somewhere like that, somewhere in Tampa or Clearwater, wherever he was staying at the time. Um we had rented a uh a rehearsal space and uh uh the singer john cyrus is what he goes by it's not his real name but um uh he decided uh that uh everyone needed to get tattoos everyone needed an agent steel logo oh, and his Jesus. weird little his weird little alien symbol that he made. I don't know, it's kind of like a little triangle with little lines coming out of it. I don't, I don't even remember what it looked like. But it was a, a little symbol that he associated, you know, with aliens and, and with the band's branding. Okay. And he wanted everyone to get that tattoo. It's like, ah, we're going down. We're going to go get tattoos. And I was just like, yeah, I'll go with you, but I'm not getting a tattoo. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're all going to get it. We're all going to get it. Everyone's gonna get it. He's all next well, to the girlfriend's name that I'm gonna break up with in yeah, five years. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> he's like, he's like, I'll get six titties, are. but I'm not getting an agent steel. Dude. <laughs> well, we we were five guys, okay, and we left that that tattoo shop that day with three of them branded. Oh, geez. and guess which two did not get the tattoo? <laughs> Me. And the guy that insisted that everyone get the tattoo. I mean, oh, you fucking what say a fucking that, cult leader. Yeah, yeah, ex exactly. <laughs> he wanted to brand everybody, but he didn't want to be branded. You know what I mean? Fucker. He just wanted. He wanted to. It was a control thing with him. And so yeah. I was just like, it, he he got so mad. He it was just like, well, well, you can't go on the tour if you don't get the tattoo. And I was just like, well, then I'm not going on the tour. And I started packing my stuff. Yeah, so you got and a sharpie. Actually, they funny. actually waited until I was driving out of the complex. And they hopped in their car and cut me off. And I thought they were going to, like, attack me. But instead, they sent Mr. Nice Guy, Richard Bateman, over, I think, to say, oh, hey, dude, they said you don't have to get the tattoo, dude. They just really want you to do the tour. It's like a game of chicken. <laughs> I was like, yeah, exactly. okay. But so many things happened on that tour. It was my very first tour ever. And actually, you got to understand that the very fourth time that I ever played live like, – Number one was the high school variety show. Yeah. Two mm -hmm. and three were at the six titties playing cover songs. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And number four was headlining Hammersmith Odeon. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> and so it was a cool experience on a lot of levels, but right. crazy stuff happened. And uh, I, I was introduced to a level of crazy that I didn't know people could uh, achieve. Wow. Yeah. Hey, I don't know whether the guy was just having problems at the time. Maybe, you know, I don't want to characterize who he is now as a person. Maybe he's gotten help. Maybe he's changed. Maybe he's grown up. I don't know. I, I wish him all the best. More power to him. But at the time, he was a nutter, and it's very well documented. <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, one of the things, you know, we understand, we were, we were actually headlining. And opening the tour was Adam Kraft. Uh, who was led by Tony Dolan, who these days is the the the, the front man of you know the bass player front man of uh, of Venom. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. yeah. and uh, but it was uh, the Demolition Man, Tony, the Demolition Man Dolan, and uh, that was his band at the time, Adam Craft. And oddly enough, and you got to understand, this was 1987. I was 19 years old. Um, the the tour manager of the tour was Tony, a different Tony. And I forget his actual last name, but we you would might know him as Abaddon. Oh okay. the drummer of Venom. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So in 1987, Tony from Venom Abaddon was a tour manager. 
and he was tour managing the tour and uh, opening that tour for us was, I think, I think we might've alternated nights in Europe. So maybe it was co-headlining. I'm not sure. It's too many years under the, you know, <laughs> under the bridge, but uh, yeah, I think possibly we alternated nights um, with nuclear assault. So it was Adam Kraft opening and, you know, nuclear assault and age of steel alternating nights. Wow. And, uh, um, frankly, I prefer to play before nuclear assault, you know? Um, yeah. Uh, and that was just a better vibe to me, but you know, you, for us, like just a weird, like sort of a proto power metal band at the time, you know, what mm -hmm. was called a speed metal band at the time with really clean vocals. I mean, that it's essentially a power metal band these days, except he sang about aliens instead of wizards. You know, <laughs> Indeed, but, that's funny. But uh, he uh, uh, he had very weird ideas, um, and one of his ideas was that you know we shouldn't talk to the opening bands, including nuclear, especially nuclear assault, because they were label mates, and they therefore they were direct competition for us at the wow. label, resources, and and attention. So we should not talk to them at all ignore them blow them off don't talk to them the entire tour and i'm and i'm sitting there as he's telling me this telling all of us that we need to do this and i'm thinking to myself what glad i didn't fuck? get the tattoo what the fuck <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah think fuck i didn't get that tattoo and the fuck i'm gonna go buy this shit and i remember we we got to london a little early and uh so the hotel room wasn't ready and it was right it was, it was all within walking distance the hamio as they call it um the Hammersmith and uh, the hotel and everything was, I think, kind of walking distance. I might, I might be misremembering that, but it was all in the same general area. And uh, but the uh, uh, the hotel wasn't ready yet. It was actually a pretty decent hotel, and the room wasn't ready yet. So the hotel said, when we you know when Agent Steel got there, they they gave us some like drink tickets and said, yeah, go over to this uh, little cantina thing next door and you know have some beverages and and relax and we'll we'll let you know when the room's ready. So we went over there and, uh, you know, we were there, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes, half an hour. And, uh, then I guess nuclear assault had showed up in their room also wasn't ready. And the hotel sent them over there as well. So mm. that was the very first time we saw nuclear assault. I was already a nuclear assault fan. So right. when he's sitting there telling us that we need to not talk to them and blow them off. I'm just like, the fuck you say, you know? Yeah. 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 And, uh, uh, I, I fucking love them. I mean, game over is the shit, you know, I right. love that album. And, uh, um, uh, Oh yeah. Uh, uh, so I recognize them right away. I see, cause I know them from the album covers. I know them from video. How could you not you know? recognize Danny? Yeah. You cannot, you cannot not recognize Danny and Paul Gang. <laughs> Danny Loker. Yeah. Head. And, uh, uh, and I was like, oh, that's Danny Loker. Fuck that. Oh man, there they are. That's nuclear salt. And I'm looking at him and, and Cyrus right away goes, yep, there they are. Don't even look at him. He turns away. <laughs> and everyone just kind of turns away. And I'm, I'm looking over at him trying to, Trying not to get seen by these assholes, you know. Yeah. That particular asshole, and I'm, I'm and I'm seeing nuclear assault, and I'm kind of giving them a little nod. I'm trying to give them a nod, like, hey, okay. like when everyone turns their head, you're like, "What's up?" But I'm just like, man, thing. I don't know what I'm in. <laughs> One of the the first thing this dude did after we got in country was he said, "Oh, this is normal, you know. Um, I'm tour managing, and it's normal that I collect all the pass everyone's passports, and I keep it safe in my lockbox." And we all hand our passports over, even my dumbass. As soon as he had our passports, he was just like, and if you piss me off, I'm going to kick uh, you off the bus in the middle of wherever and without your passport. You know, he literally said that to us. So I was like, oh, Jesus. So, so I'm sitting there not doing what the hell right? to even do. <laughs> and I'm watching John and he's refusing to look at him. And he does this. He goes. <laughs> like he's rubbing child. his head with it. And I look over and I see those guys see it. They're looking at they're, they're like trying to get our attention, like, hey, hey, as they're trying to get in the door and yeah. they see that, they go, wait, what the fuck? What the yeah, fuck? And then, yeah. you know, and then someone controlled them. I, I think they would have come in and just started throwing hands, you know? Right. Totally. But uh, someone with them, it may have been Tony, it may have been Abaddon, but, you know, someone calmed them down and said, look, just fucking ignore them back, you know? Fuck it. This is the way they're going to be, then fuck them. You oh. Know? I love everybody it's, I've toured with. It's so funny that I'm hearing this because it's like I, I the first thing I want to do is get to know everybody that I'm going to exactly, be on the road with. Exactly. Yeah, you yeah. Wanna, you want to, you want you know, to, going on this time, adventure. You know? We're going on so, an adventure so, together. So, so to to sort of wrap that story up, you know, 
you know, we, we all go to our hotel rooms. We get our de- hotel rooms at different times. You know, we went in first and then those guys. And then I went down and I went out and about. I was looking for, you know, I had the evening to myself. I was looking for, you know, get, get a snack, maybe look for a little souvenir for my mom or some crap like that. The kind of thing you right. do when you're in London for the Yeah, first just get time. the fuck away from everybody else. Go do yeah, your own little yeah, tour yeah, thing. Yeah, I wanted yeah. to do walkies. I wanted to check out Carnaby Street, whatever, you know. I wanted to do all of that. Yeah. And so I, I went and was doing that. And when I came back, um, I'm crossing the lobby, headed towards the lift, as they say, the, the elevator. And uh, and the door was closing. So I, you know, I hustled and slid right through it. Just nice. threaded the needle. Indiana right Jones in style. Thing. And, I'm, and, I, and I'm standing there and I look up and surrounding me in a semicircle is like, is the, is the fucking nuclear salt. And they're all looking at me like, <laughs> one of those motherfuckers. And I stood up, I looked oh, up at the deer in headlights for a second. And I was just like, I was like, dudes, I don't know what the fuck that shit was all about. I'm new. I just signed on for this tour. I fucking love you guys. This hit me. You know, they were like, oh, fuck yeah. I knew one of them had to be cool. <laughs> nice, <laughs> you know, yeah. dude, you know, cool. So they were, they were like, they relaxed and, and, you know, and I, I, I spent most of the tour hanging out with them. Good. <laughs> fuck yeah. That's the needles the to say. That's the end of the story I, I wanted to hear. So bad with that. Yeah. Yeah, that was, had I mean, to been that... your, your last tour probably with that dude, right? With oh yeah, the... yeah. You know, I ref- they yeah. tried to get me to uh, to stick with them a little longer, and I I refused. In fact, in fact, you. I had to pull some stuff. Times. I had to pull. I had to be deceptive to get my gear back because you know that's called cardage. With you know that the companies that send your gear back and forth across overseas and stuff, it's a, a cardage companies do that. And we were waiting for the cardage, and I, I was only sticking around at this apartment that they rented down in South Florida after we got back from that tour. I was only sticking around in Just order to make sure to, all your uh, shit showed up. To, to get my shit and my kit kept not showing up, not showing up, not showing up. And there was this kid, young kid that they had as a roadie. He was like two years younger than me. He was 17. I was 19, but he was big. You know, I was tall and skinny. He was kind of short, but stocky, you know, mm-hmm, kind of, mm-hmm. kind of built. And, uh, Cyrus started getting him to fuck with me. I think because I had, uh, I had said I liked King Diamond, but I thought King Diamond was killer because <laughs> you know? it came on MTV. Like some King Diamond came on MTV. And I was like, they wanted to change it. I was like, Oh fuck. I love this. And, it pissed Cyrus off that I liked King Diamond, so he got this roadie Jeez, to fuck with little me. fucking weirdo, dude. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, this guy, this, this guy, guy is just so yeah, he was not doing, my style, he, dude. This guy exactly. was doing uh, Cyrus's bidding and coming over and fucking with me about it. And he and I'm sitting there on the couch trying to watch this damn video, really just waiting for my card cardage to get back so I can get my yeah. gear. But this kid starts poking me in the chest. He goes, "What are you gonna do? What are you gonna do, Murphy? What are you gonna do?" I was just like, I'm going to punch you in the fucking face. That's what I'm going to do. He's like, uh, you wouldn't fucking, you can't, you ain't got the nerve to punch me. Like, Bam! I punched him right in the fucking face. Nice. And then, <laughs> then we were fighting for like probably the longest fight I've ever been in my life. It just no kept shit. going and going and going. When we finally, when it finally ended, we were both in the bathroom swishing salt water because of all the cuts inside all the our blood mouth. And from, cuts from and cuts and each uh, other upside the head, uh, you know? And, but we were both so tired and so done. We just didn't fight anymore. We were just passing the salt to each other. I hear him. Isn't that funny? Yeah. Kind of like this respect after that. Like, uh, yeah, yeah. It was kind of we like both that. Went, we both so, put ourselves through but, that. But, and, but I, you know, I called my mom and I told her what had happened. I was just like, yeah, I'm sorry. I sound funny, but I got to fight and all this, this shit happened. And I just want my gear back. And she was just like, I don't care. You can get your gear back later. I'm coming to get you. And I was just mm-hmm. like, yeah, all yeah. right. Yeah. I can't really stand to be here another day. And right. so I go back home from making that call. Cause you know, he had to walk to a payphone to do that in those days. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I go back home from making that call and they're all looking for Richard, Richard Bateman. Like Richard's gone. Where is he? I don't know. Well, all this stuff is here. His clothes, his base, everything, everything's here. He had just escaped. He just escaped. <laughs> So he's he's just like the off same like, feelings he didn't you're want feeling. any suspicion, so he just walked away and left everything. And Damn, just, just escaped. Just Irish goodbye to his whole situation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Dude. I feel and, like uh, that's like a Jonestown. Like, well, I got news for you guys. Uh, I'm out of here too, man. My mom's gonna be rolling up anytime. Yeah, a couple of, it was gonna be it's gonna be a few hours because it was you know it's a three four. Did hour you drive. get all that? Did you get your gear back and all that stuff? Here's how I ended up getting my stuff back. I told him I was out and I wanted to do with him anymore, and that I better get my gear when he gets back, or I'll have the cops involved. Blah blah blah. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, they got the cartridge back and they kept lying to me about, you know, when I could collect it. They kept, 
And uh, but then they decided that they were moving back to California, and that and that they wanted me to come with them and be in the band. You know, I guess because I was the one that was writing material. And <laughs> yeah, they're like, oh wait, <laughs> good reason to write only <laughs> You know, I had I had written a song. I was the only one that had. You know, so, right. um, uh, so they wanted me to uh, to go with them, and I said, look, I'll consider it, but I need a sign of good faith. Mm-hmm. So good when move. you guys come through, Pat, you, you're going to have to drive right past my the area where I live to to head out out of florida to go to california so <laughs> stop by my house bring me my gear mm-hmm. and if everything's there intact we'll talk. And, and and not fucked with i will th- consider going with you then you know mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. i'll i'll be pre-packed just in case i decide to go i'll be pre-packed and they were yeah. like okay and so they brought me my gear and i said no man you have to let me i have to know that this isn't being held hostage you have to let me unpack it right you know you have to right. let me put it in my house and they so they let me put it in my house, and then they sat there and waited for me to come out to, to, uh, to go with them. I let them stew there for about 10 15 minutes. I stuck my head out the door and said, I ain't coming with you, idiots. Get out of here. <laughs> Got him. I, I knew, knew it, it dude. <laughs> yeah. I knew it, and I love yeah, so it. That's great. That was dude. that, yeah. And uh, it was really a good thing that I did because those guys got arrested somewhere in the middle of the country because the kid that he sicked on me to beat to to to. to to uh, fight me because I liked King Diamond. <laughs> wow, um, dude! That kid. They ended up tying that kid up in a hotel room somewhere in the middle of the country and setting off firecrackers on him. Jesus! Oh. And they ended up. Got, they got busted. Got caught. Got arrested. And it got yep. right up in the paper. And I remember sitting there going, "Like, oh my god!" Not that there was any chance that I was ever going to stay with them after just even the way he behaved before the tour, much less everything that happened during it and after it. Yeah, but. Thank fuck. I didn't, you know. No, you handled that perfectly, dude. You got your yeah. shit back intact. Crazy, and, crazy, crazy. And then crazy gave, him, gave him the bird and said, fuck yeah. it, go. I, live I, your I started life. Back to teaching guitar lessons for about a year and a half. Then I decided to move to Atlanta, where I, I became the roommate of uh, Dave Stewart from Hollow's Eve. Mm-hmm. Uh, long story short, started jamming with Dave and Tommy from Hollow's Eve. And, uh, you know, we're, we're working on new material, going to try to see about, you know, renewing the deal with metal blade and, and carrying on as hollow's eve and that was going to be my next band and that's when i got the call from chuck mm. so okay yeah let's talk about the call let's talk let's hear all those details <laughs> yeah dude. so the call so i mean was it was it from chuck, i mean chuck who? He's here. He's yeah was it chuck, chuck like... Schuldiner, yeah. <laughs> no, oh, oh no, sorry. <laughs> no, just, yeah chuck, was, uh, was chuck uh, uh peters well you gotta uh, uh it's important to know a little bit of backstory before I moved to Atlanta, I uh, had gone to a death show and uh, Mm -hmm. it was in support of leprosy. So as I said, the age of steel tour was 87. They were touring in support of leprosy. So it was 88 sometime in 88 and they played a place called the sunset club in Tampa. It doesn't exist anymore. The building's been torn down. It used to be kind of, diagonally across the street from the original uh, brass mug location which is sort oh, of like the iconic you know death metal bar for you know for florida but uh for tampa anyway uh, and uh anyway I, I was you know i was very much a death fan i had seen them you know very early days live and i you know so i knew i was you know i was familiar with scream bloody gore and leprosy had them both on cassette in my car you know and uh loved them and so I was going to go to the show and I wanted to jockey for position. So as I, I parked and I headed into the club because I wanted to get in there and, you know, get a nice spot. And uh, I was wearing a shirt from that Agent Steel tour. And at, I'm just beelining for the door. I'm not even looking left or right. And, uh, and at, just as I'm about to make the door, I hear from off over to my left, cool shirt dude <laughs> <laughs> yeah and uh yeah, that is. i looked over and it was chuck i recognized him right away yeah. i was like yeah, oh, yeah hey chuck what's up man and so we ended up talking and he was like dude where'd you get that shirt and i explained to him well, well i i earned it by touring with the band he goes oh you're that dude from here that got got the gig with age of steel and i was like yeah 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 and so he asked me about the whole thing i told him the whole story i just told you guys he was like oh man that's fucking nuts but 
it makes sense. I always heard he was crazy, you know. <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. It was just, you know, kooky. Now the other thing is that having done that tour uh, over uh, over there with Agent Steel, you know, we played in Holland, of course, and I met this guy named Advan Osh, who had a little fanzine called Ravenous Mag, Ravenous Magazine. It was a little black and white Xerox copied fanzines, you know. Yeah, he did a really nice little job with it. And I had gotten a long conversation with him, you know, because I had been a tape trader for years and and I was I had, you know, taken writing. I, I fancied myself able to write a few lines here and there. Now, when I look back at what I wrote in in that fanzine, uh, I, I can only laugh and say, what the hell was I thinking? I sucked. <laughs> it was awful. But, uh, uh, you know, through my conversation with Ad, you know, when I met him in Holland, uh, he was just like, yeah, well, you know, maybe you can interview some bands for me over there, like in the Tampa scene, the Tampa shows and, and, you know, you know, for, for my, uh, for the fanzine and you'll be like a U.S. correspondent. And I was like, okay, cool. Yeah, I'll do that. Nice. And I, you know, I came home and I never gave it another thought until I was yeah. standing there with Deb and I was like, you know, this would be a good opportunity to do something for ad, for ad, you know, ad Van Osh and, and Ravenous Mag. So I, I broached the subject. Those guys said, Hey, you know what, you know, if you guys got some time before or after, um, can we, we can just go somewhere and let me ask you guys a few questions for this fanzine. I, I, I write for this, you know, uh, Dutch, uh, you know, uh, fanzine. And, you know, I got my little Kodak disc camera with me. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. Price, uh, uh, I don't know if you guys remember those there. Maybe they were before your time. I don't know, but, um, disc. It was, well, it was filmed. It was literally on a little disc. It came out like a, like a disc and you'd see all the frames arrayed around the disc. Oh yeah, 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 oh yeah, yeah, yeah. One of the one of these ones. Yeah. Well, well, but it was like, an actual yeah, camera. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But you like yeah, you click it through and you see every picture. Yeah, yeah. I'm oh, talking for about. Sure, yeah. For sure. No, yeah. no, no. It wasn't one of those things where you can view the pictures. Not at all. Oh, okay. you're taking it was pictures. Similar, but it was filmed, and you take the pictures, then you turn the disc in and get it developed, just like in. Oh, movie. gotcha. So, no, that's before my time. Yeah. Yeah. So they agreed. <laughs> and, you know, we went over literally across the street, up against a, a, a building, and I took some really crappy photos of them, and I did a really crappy interview with them because I just I sucked at that. It was the first time I ever interviewed a band, and ever took a photo of a band. Mm -hmm. And uh, but you know, it did make it to the little fanzine. But while I was talking to those guys, I noticed a dynamic. I I noticed that they seem to not be too keen on rick now i love rick you know and uh, uh and you know and terry and rick obviously get on great these days because they're on tour together right now with left to die and uh, mm -hmm. uh and you know they've done numerous things together since since those days but back in those days chuck had kind of in his mind decided to to move on from rick and uh and he he, he wasn't all that happy with him for whatever reason. So I, I tended to notice, I noticed this tendency in them to whenever Rick would turn away from them, or they would sort of look at each other and kind of roll their eyes like, Oh God, you know, this, that, and the other, you know, for whatever reason, I don't even know the details. I don't care. Didn't care. I was just like, Hmm, well, I like Rick, but I would really wouldn't mind playing in death either. So right. I decided to give them my phone number. I said, Hey guys. And I didn't, I, you know, I didn't say, Hey, you guys, Ever need, you know, I was like, you guys ever know any bands? You know, you guys are on combat records. I've I've already toured in a band on combat. You guys know any other bands on the roster? You know, or anyone you tour with, anyone you run across that needs a guitar player. Yeah. Just show them call. that you're available. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I wrote my number on a little piece of paper for Terry and for Chuck. Mm -hmm. And uh they both stuck them away in their pockets. And I thought, well, that's that. I'll never hear from any of them. And of course, my number at the time, you know, my best number at that time was my mom's number. And uh that's where I was staying. But I, I moved up to Atlanta and, and uh, I was I had gone up there with the intention of attending uh, uh, AIM, which at, which was the Atlanta Institute of Music, which at the time was a sister school of Musicians Institute, uh, which oh, gotcha. at the time at that time was called GIT Guitar Institute of Technology. It's That's right. Called yep. Musicians Institute these days. I just happened to be wearing an MI hat that I bought when I stopped <laughs> by there. I never attended it, but I stopped by and I bought a hat. <laughs> when I was in LA, one time. and yeah. uh, uh, nice. but anyway, I wanted to go to AIM. It was it was very pricey. I didn't know how I was going to afford it. Um, I was interested, you know. Maybe I thought maybe I could get a student loan, but I didn't have credit for shit, you know. And uh, so I, uh, I I went. I did. I I, I went to like a a tour. I took a tour of AIM, and I got to sit in on a clinic or two. Um, 
and uh you know then they wanted me to to sign up and pay money so i i couldn't afford it i couldn't figure out how to do it so i ended up just getting a a job at a landscaping company and becoming roommates with dave stewart and ultimately that led to jamming with you know hollow's eve you know or, or at least at the attempt at the time to resurrect hollow's eve mm-hmm. and uh so i was doing that and we had you know, we had worked on some music. We had been audition. We had found a drummer. We were auditioning some other position. I forget exactly what. I think Tommy didn't want to sing anymore. He just wanted to play bass. Maybe we were auditioning singers. I'm not really sure because uh, first it was Stacy on vocals, I think, and then Tommy, the bass player, was going to ended up singing. I'm I'm not really sure how it all shook out. My memory gets jumbled, but um, we were we were doing auditions, looking for some more musicians, and I was sitting at home one night in my room. Um, uh, playing guitar and uh, Dave uh, comes to the door and knocks on my door and uh, he, uh, sticks his head in and he goes, Hey, uh, you got a phone call. And I thought, Oh, that's my mom. Sure. That's the only person who ever fucking calls me here. So, um, <laughs> you know, I'm going to talk to my mom, see what the hell she wants. And yeah. he goes, dude, dude. And he's had this crazy look on his face. He goes, dude, I think it's, I think it's evil Chuck. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> and I was just like, really? Fuck. So I went, I went and talked to him. And he was like, hey, dude, we kicked out Rick. And, you know, if you want to audition, you know, we're we're, we're going to be holding auditions this coming weekend. You know, we'd like to try you out, man. We remember you were cool. And, you know, we know you could probably do it because, you know, you toured with Aiden Steel, you know, pulled that off. You know, you can do it. You, can, you know, you, mm-hmm. you, you might be the right guy. So you should come and try out. And, I, and uh, if you haven't heard this story before. Cause I have told it before, but if, if, if you haven't heard the story before, you're not going to believe what came out of my mouth. Dude, I would love to, but I'm sort of in it in deep with it, with these guys here. We're trying, you know, we're, you know, I, I feel like some loyalty to these guys, you know, we're, we're working on music. We're auditioning the final musician we need for the lineup and metal blade wants to hear a demo and we're, so we're working on the material for the demo and we're going to try to, rejuvenate the deal with metal blade man but thanks so much for thinking of me man that's awesome that's like, legit though that's, that's i mean you're sticking to your guns kind of i mean it's kind of yeah, like yeah. you've been well, working on like it's on, like in your heart you know yeah well later on you know some, some of the fellows came over some of the fellows there from the atlanta scene that, that i had made they were friends with dave and that i had made friends with and uh two of them in particular were uh richard and Britt turner and at that time they were in a band in atlanta called nihilist nothing mm-hmm. to do with the nihilist from sweden that eventually became right. entombed completely different band this, oh, this okay. was like a, a you know speed thrash with tinges of death metal early death metal vibe mm-hmm. you know uh band nihilist from atlanta and uh, you can i i've been there's a, a few photographs that have been around of, of me for years wearing a nihilist shirt and people always like dude i never saw that nihilist shirt and i was like because it's not the nihilist you're thinking of that's why. okay yeah but uh, uh I, yeah but, i didn't uh, put that all together it, Interesting point of fact is so it was Richard and Britt from Nihilus, the drummer and bass player. And, you know, they're they're still around these days playing music, but they're doing like sort of a classic rock, blues rock scene. They're there. They are the bass player and drummer of Blackberry Smoke. So they're still around today and Mm. uh, gigging and playing all the time, making records. But uh, those guys were there. And so Dave Stewart asked me, yo, James, what? So what happened? What, What was the call with? with chuck about and i was like uh he you know he wanted me to 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 come audition for death and they they just looked at me wide-eyed and i said yeah but i told them you know i got you know i'm sort of loyal to my situation here and i all of them including david stewart were just, are you fucking crazy dude <laughs> yeah <You're fucking> nuts <laughs> and i stood there and just absorbed that i was just like you know what i think i am fucking nuts <laughs> <laughs> So I tried to call Chuck back. His yeah. mom answered. Uh-huh. Jane answered. That was my first time talking to her ever. And uh, she said, oh, oh, he, Ch- Chuck Chuck left. He'll be back, you know, way later tonight. But it might be too late to call. But you could call him tomorrow, you know, and uh, and, or, and I'll let him know you called. And he'll call you back tomorrow probably. I was like, okay, thank, thank you. But. I had called him to say, no, I changed my mind. I absolutely want to come. So I hadn't, I didn't have a chance to speak to Chuck. So I, I just took matters in my own hands. And I, I went to work the next day and told them, I'm not going to be coming tomorrow. 
which was Friday. I'm so I'm, I'm packing up. I'm, I, I got to go to Florida. I'm, something's up with my mom. I got to go help my mom with something. So, um, yeah, I'm not, I'm, I'll be back on Monday, the following Monday. And, uh, they were, you know, they were cool with it. And I, so I had my car packed on Friday, ready to use for, you know, eight, about an eight hour drive from Atlanta to, to my, my mom's home in, in Florida, eight to nine hours, depending on traffic. So uh, I figured I'd kill Friday doing that. Maybe come out and hang with those dudes on, uh, on Saturday, uh, in the evening, it's been Saturday since Saturday during the day with my family. Go hang with the, go meet up with the death guys if I could. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, you know, I was just figured I got to go anyway. So anyway, Chuck yeah. called me back and I said, "Dude, I'm 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 coming. Uh, I absolutely want to audition. I don't know what the fuck I was thinking, and those guys didn't know what the fuck I was thinking, you know. And yeah. he was just like, "Oh, dude." Dude, we had like a little list, man. And when when you passed on it, we called the next guy on the list, and he came down that that night. You know, he came down last night, and 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 we we chose him. We told him he has the gig. It's this, it's this guy oh, Mark, this guy Mark, man. And he's he's got the gig, man. And I, I'm sorry, you know. So ah, oh, fuck. And I decide I was just like, well, look, dudes, I'm coming anyway because I've already taken the time off work. My family's already expecting me. Everyone's got their hopes up to see me. So I'm going to come and, uh, you know, maybe we can just hang out. We'll just hang. And they said, well, yeah, well, we're all hanging out and spending the night, like at Terry's house on, uh, you know, on Saturday night. So, you know, come on out and meet up, meet up with a Saturday evening at, at Terry's. And we'll give you the address. And so I got the address from him and I, and, uh, I came, you know, I brought my guitar. I brought, you know, my little practice, my little amp, little, little practice amp. And I brought my boom box and my death tapes. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I went. And uh, I went and find, met up with them over at Terry's house on Saturday evening. And mostly we just hung out. We hung out. We talked records. We talked old French heavy metal bands. I got to see Terry had all the same records, you know, the H-Bomb and the Sword of Lage and Satan Jokers and all yeah. that French stuff. And uh, that, that we were all into. And uh, as you remember, this was 1989. And mm-hmm. those albums had just come out like, you know, five, six years earlier. You know, we we're, were, we're into that stuff. Totally. And, uh, still into it to this day because you're always into stuff you're into when you're a kid usually right. but uh 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 so most of that mostly that's what we did we hung we bonded over music and talked and so i said well you know guys i'm, a, I'm probably about to leave you know get get back to my mom's house where it gets too late but uh i don't want to wake her up in the middle of the night coming in you know so so uh but you know it's one thing i'd like to do before i leave and and i said i just got to go out to my car real quick and they said okay cool you know, so I went out to the car and I grabbed my guitar, my little practice amp, my boom box. Mm-hmm. I brought it in. And I said, I just want to play you guys some stuff. You know, just so you know, if something ever happens with this guy, you'll know whether I can play your stuff or not. And they were just like, hmm, okay. So you don't have to do anything. Just sit and listen to me. And I, I played the, t- I, I put on various songs from Leprosy and Scream Bloody Gore and played along with them. And, uh, you know, I knew those songs really well. You know, I had them down. So, yeah. Uh, Hell yeah. Uh, and when it came to like, I had already known from talking to Chuck uh, when he first called me to tell me that they had let go of Rick, that he was over Whammy Bar at the time. He was mm-hmm. over it. Mm-hmm. And that's the reason why when you listen to Spiritual Healing, if you pay attention, there's no Whammy Bar on it. But I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, um, he just didn't want anyone. To, now, here's the thing. I think Rick is awesome with Whammy Bar stuff. He does that really well. It's, it's cool, man. He get, he coaxes evil sounds out of that thing. But uh, uh, Chuck wasn't into it. So I knew not to try to play Rick's solos. So I would just play my own solos over the top of Rick's. They'd just be going at the same time. But his were kind of like, you know, Whammy Bar stuff. So they almost sounded like background accompaniment to my solo. and didn't really... Mm-hmm heard anything so i I, when i was done they were i could see them during the time i was playing they looking at each other and kind of like nodding with like their their eyes like kind of "Hmm, yeah okay Mm -hmm. he can he can play the shit he can do it and uh so i just i wrapped it up i think i I think i played six seven songs probably i wrapped it up and uh thanked them for their time and said yeah man so really cool hanging with you i'm gonna beat it yeah. Give me a call if anything ever comes up, or even if you some other band, you know, that you think might could use a guitar. Mm-hmm. And uh, I went back 
end up going back to Atlanta and uh, uh, was getting ready to go to work. Uh, and uh, the phone rang. And Dave came to my room. Dude, I think it's evil Chuck again. <laughs> how long, how many days after you I, got It was back? a couple of days. It was a couple of days. Okay. Um, uh, let's put it, it wasn't very long because I had not completely unpacked my car yet. Oh wow! Okay. Uh, so I was lazy, and I was still I was definitely still left so an impression. Then. About what happened, you know, that I didn't even have the motivation to unpack my car, you know, fully. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I took my guitar out and stuff, but everything else was pretty much still in there, clothes and all that. And uh, you know, I had cleaned out my room, you know, but I came back, and uh, and uh, so Chuck called, and uh, he goes, "Dude, Mark didn't work out." you got the gig if you want it you've already auditioned we know you can do it so we don't even we don't even need to try you out you're just you're in you got it if you want it and i was like hell yes i want it i'm coming back i was like dude i haven't even completely unpacked my car so right on <laughs> i'm <laughs> you know? there already yeah. yeah 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 i was like i'll believe it night i called I, I i went by my job and just said i'm out mail my last check here i'm gone you know yeah. <laughs> hell and, yeah uh, dude and uh i uh hopped in my car and headed back to Florida. And what happened with the Mark guy was that uh, he showed up that first night, his audition night when he got the gig, but for the next two nights in a row that they they had practice scheduled for rehearsal scheduled for and writing sessions, he, he called out. He was like, Oh, we're going to make it tonight. Blah, blah, blah. This and that. Some excuse. Mm -hmm. First night they were like, "Ah, that sucks, but uh, okay. He did it the next night and they were like, yeah, you're done, son. (sighs) And so they called me up well, and the gig was mine. Dang. So the universe works in mysterious ways. <laughs> yeah. 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 You know? Yeah. Definitely. And and uh I'm sure Mark's listening to this because we know you are, Mark. Um <laughs> you fucked up, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> you fucked up hard, Mark. And dude, that's 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 a such a killer story, dude. So now, now to keep the momentum of that, like, what was it like? So you came back to Florida. Was it just hit the ground running type deal? How long before you guys went out and did gigs together? All that kind of stuff. Was it right? Well, right, first, right away, or? they were already writing spiritual healing. They had four songs written. So I, I walked into my first day of practice right. with half the album done. And so that first day, they just showed me those four songs. And we practiced those four songs. Wow. Very next day, like, okay, we got at least four more songs to write. Let's go. Chuck goes, I got this riff. And then he looks at me, he goes, you got something that could connect to that, come after that? And I went, yeah, 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 I got something. And I just pulled a riff out of my ass on the spot. Did you guys, <laughs> just a question, like, back in those days, like, did you guys just, was it all, was it just all memory of, of, of the riffs? Or did you, like, you know, like, record the tapes, like, at home or kind of, like, you know, with a little set up like a or just no we just did it in person right there and we we would record it with yeah. boombox that's it a boombox, boombox yeah yeah, yeah. Boombox remember them that, okay it. yeah i, mean, yeah. I think that probably the, the first riff i wrote might have been the the chorus of low life you know mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like that that guy. Yeah, I'm yeah. Not, yeah, yeah. Played it right, right now, but I mean, he, he played the the opening part of it, and then he stopped, and he was like, "Oh, we need something there, like a chorus or something like that." And I was just, I just played it. I just kind of made it up as I went. <laughs> nice, dude. Evil. Yeah. Bill Bill came in right on drums, just like dude. perfect, just like <laughs> almost just like he did on the record, and it just yeah came together so that feeling so that feeling right actually oh sorry keep going with what you're saying yeah so I, I ended up co-writing the remaining four songs with them you know yeah and i was just every single riff that i presented uh chuck accepted and stuck it in a song we stuck it in a song that's uh, that's so crazy to me dude i just want to know that feeling like so you're you're showing well, that's up not even like... the weirdest story about it the weirdest story is we were taking a break and i was doing a finger exercise to keep my hands warm i you know, we, we, we would open, roll up the, the storage room door and walk outside, you know, to catch a little air because these were storage spaces, you know, and I, mm-hmm. I was doing this finger exercise and I was just walking around 
no volume, or I think very low volume. I cut the volume way down and I was on the amp and I was just like. Mm -hmm. Just doing a little legato finger exercise. That's all yep. it was. And I had been doing it for a couple minutes. And Chuck, we were all talking back and forth and uh, all of a sudden, but Chuck just, just keyed in on it. And he goes, James, what is that you're playing? And I was just like, yeah, it's a finger exercise. <laughs> and he goes, keep doing it. And he runs over and grabs his guitar, matches his volume to mine and starts, you know, whatever the chord, I don't even know the chords underneath it. Uh, yeah. He came up with the chords underneath it. I just kept doing that. Mm -hmm. Boom. That, and that was how we started off Killing Spree and we wrote the rest of the right. song. I think probably that evening or that evening and the next bang Damn. that team, Killing Spree. That's how that came together. Damn, that's really cool. That's, awesome. that's going to be trick. such a good that's feeling. Dude. I was just doing to keep my hands warmed up. You know, that's so cool. And yeah, but that, also it's that's, a song. That's just uh, synchronicity. It's um, just the stars aligning at the time where you guys all were on that same level of, I don't know, creativity. And you guys, that that feeling of working with other brains and everybody's brains kind of on the same wavelength. And then it, it was just 100% natural and copacetic. Everything just came together. You know, yeah. it, it was almost effortless writing those songs. I mean, if there were any hangups, I don't remember them. They were so insignificant. If we had any sticking points or rough spots in trying to bang out those last four songs, they were so small that I don't even remember them all these years later. I just remember how smooth and cool everything came together. And uh, so once, you know, those eight songs were, were done, it was time for us to enter the studio. And this would have been like around probably August or September of, uh, of 89. Mm -hmm. And we went into more sound, recorded the album and it came out on, uh, came out in February, 1990. Wow. Damn. That's awesome. That's man. beautiful, dude. I mean, I know. incredible. Yeah. I, I hope everybody got some spiritual healing about <laughs> during that because that that is like you you've heard so many nightmares with certain great records you know and for when they all come together like everything's just like boom everything everyone's and, clicking and like hyping and each other for up. you to come in like right at that moment to yeah, yeah be able to hop on the train as it's already running smoothly no injuries yeah. you know you're you're the, sorry sorry no no i was just saying you're on the train and running and you're you're you're, you're full force just with the, with how they were and and that shows how the drive you had at the time your skill set at the time confidence all that stuff yeah you know i was i was too young to uh know that i shouldn't be so damn confident <laughs> <laughs> well, hey. uh but uh 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 you know, uh, the, another thing of note about that that album was, as I had mentioned before, Chuck, you know, he didn't want to hear any whammy bar. Now, I had always been a guy that used the bar expressively. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't need yeah. to use it. I can, you know, perfectly play Band. without a bar. I don't I don't rely on it as a crutch. I, I, I just yeah. use it as an expression thing. Yeah. And uh, so I took my bars out of my guitars. I left. I, I didn't even by the time we were in there uh, recording the album, I didn't even know where they were. Mm -hmm. you know I, I, yeah. I didn't even i couldn't even find them you know yeah. so there there are there's no whammy bar on me chuck didn't even have tremolo systems on his guitars me i did but i didn't have the physical bar itself so the one spot we decided that we wanted a what chuck called a grinder at the time of <laughs> yeah right? yeah he wanted off. one and it's <laughs> It's it's in the middle of the uh, of the solos on, on the title track, spiritual healing, mm. sort of like great song. It marks my my part from his. It's just right in between them. Okay. And so I did it okay. because I had a tremolo system on my guitar. But in order to do it, Scotty Scotty Burns had to go grab a screwdriver from the tech room. <laughs> which I just stuck in the hole and I did that grinder with a screwdriver because it, nice. it yeah, I got you, got you. 
Awesome, like, dude. It, so, so just specifically, like, what was the part of the whammy bar that Chuck was the most bummed about? Was it like the dive bomb, like harmonic thing, like going on with like Slayer I, I and think it was the whole thing. I, I, I think it was the all whole of thing. it. You know, he just he, out of tune. He was all just sort of or, or of over. Could you imagine? I mean, it'd be the same thing if he had a you know a guitar player who only played in you know neapolitan minor every freaking solo you know you're not even <laughs> sick of that you know yeah, yeah. yeah that tonality you know yeah i could yeah so it was it was no big deal you know it was just no i, I love it i was just curious it's super cool yeah, yeah that's I, I absolutely and obviously by the time you know andy laroque is playing and, and i think even other guys before andy you know they were using bar you know creatively and expressively yeah. on, on their death solos but yeah, I I sure. didn't, I didn't, but I, I made up for it when I played on Cause of Death because I was able to get in all my little, my cool little expressive yeah, stuff, yeah. and I, and I I did some of the old, you know, you know all those. Yeah, yeah. You can't really hear them now. So like the the Dimebag like, kind of harmonic kind of. I mean, Dimebag's known for doing those, yeah. those before, before his time too. But yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Not to jump ahead, but I had a really good time with a, a fan made super cut of all your solos from a 1990 obituary set on yeah, uh, that, YouTube. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know whether it was the person who made it or just yeah. a, a, a fan who thought I would think it was cool. Fan, you know, but that was you know the. It's actually been sent to me many, 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 many times, and I like. People don't get it. That's the last thing in the world that I would play. <laughs> I'm not trying to sit and listen to a supercut of all my damn solos in a row. It's totally. Just, and and that's, oh, that's how right. all of us would Absolutely look. If somebody nuts. if somebody came up to me and said, hey, dude, I have a super cut of all your fucking growls that I love on all your records, <laughs> they'd be like, I need to run in the opposite direction. Exactly. <laughs> no, I feel that. You know but exactly where I'm coming from. I'm speaking. Yeah, I, yes, I feel you know as the artist, but as I'm going to separate <laughs> myself from the artist and just be the fan that I have been of yours for, you know, two plus decades. Um, it was just a nice, refreshing little thing that I hadn't watched before. Um, I obviously kind of brought you love, back nostalgia. Yeah, yeah. Stuff. I mean, Cause yeah, yeah, of Death yeah. was one of my uh, introductory, legendary albums that I still love today. And I actually texted these guys uh, today how I'm really I loved reconnecting with the old obituary, doing my little crunch for Good dives, all, you know. And um, but seeing that supercut and just really focusing in on all the solo work and stuff it really just it, it has no other relevance other than it just recharged me of james murphy obituary obviously i've had so much time with spiritual healing i still loved reconnecting with that album but you know it's been longer listening to obituary than it has been for spiritual healing and i i want to continue just you know kind of wrap up the story with death and see how you got into the knowing the obituary guys obviously the scene is how you guys came across each other i just wanted to hear the transition from that to obituary well you know i, I sort of saw the writing on the wall with with death um mm -hmm. well you know me and chuck got along really awesome during the writing process there you know i don't think i'm telling tales out of school to say that, you know, I, I think it's been well enough documented by enough people mm -hmm. that, you know, Chuck didn't enjoy any sort of dissent. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm trying to say this in a way, dude, I, dude, I love Chuck and, and, uh, uh I, I would I would do anything to bring him back, you know. Totally good. I, I know. I so I don't want anyone to get an impression that I that I harbor any no or actually towards Chuck. Just, I absolutely don't. I, I you know I. We've you know, heard I, enough. We've heard both sides of it, James. So 
don't yeah, feel you know, like you you tough, tough are can be difficult but hey i'm not i'm not painting myself as an angel when i say that i you know i was young headstrong and you know so full of shit my eyes were brown you know what i mean right yeah. so you know I'm, I'm i'm guilty too i'm a guilty party as well but right we were all you know you know i i could have been a bit more diplomatic you know i didn't have to flaunt things that i flaunted sometimes you know yes. what i mean like ego is a i mean it ego is like the make or breaker thing for a lot of artists yeah. dude it's it's one of the driving forces in in the reason why we make things in the first place because we want to solidify parts of ourselves in time for when we're past it'll still be there while we gone we're gone it's just like the same way we make kids yeah of course and, it, it, it you know, absolutely car carved his niche in the in the Mount Rushmore of music period, much less, right. less death yeah. metal. So, so um, he succeeded in that, but I'm saying the, but, what, uh, you know, what uh, gets you there is with ego, you know, and I'm not just saying with, yeah, yeah. No, we all Chuck, had it because we were, we were young and, and it's stupid. And I know? had it too. And, and we've all went through that early yeah, yeah. phase so I, of I, life. I would say, you know, Chuck, Chuck was very much going through that when, when, when we parted ways, so was I, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and, uh, but you know, Chuck had a little bit of that that impulse to shut people out, like the way John Cyrus did. Like I remember the very first, I think the second show I ever played with Death. Um, I, I played two shows with Death prior to Spiritual coming out, at least two. There was one in Orlando, and one of them was Milwaukee Metal Fest. I think Milwaukee Metal Fest three, maybe I don't know. But uh, uh, we were headed up to Milwaukee, and you know, I I was looking at we were looking at a list of all who all was playing, and I remember that it, it listed Immolation as playing. Now, as a tape trader, I already had their demo. Nice. I already was an Immolation fan. I oh, knew, yeah. and I, I had heard that they had been signed to Roadrunner. I knew they were going to be coming out with their debut. I was excited, and I wanted to meet these guys. Yeah. And uh, Chuck was like, "Whoa, Immolation, man! Fuck these, you know, these new breed bullshit bands." And that's what he would call them. You know, bands like mm -hmm. that. Any band that came along after him, unfortunately. But uh, uh, you know, that was just youth. You know, I, I'm quite sure he grew out of that impulse. You know, right? Well, I was just um, about to say you just ran into another nuclear salt situation, dude. So yeah, it was, it was, that you're not not as bad. You shouldn't be say, down with what you're down with, bad. dude. Yeah, it wasn't as bad. Like he didn't antagonize those guys. He wasn't throwing them, flipping them birds and stuff. Yeah, like he that. didn't no. fight you over it, and you didn't. Yeah, have to nothing, nothing salt like water with him, but he wasn't. It wasn't happy that I went on, went right on ahead and talked to Immolation and got it, got their T-shirt and wore it and got yeah, to, <laughs> you know. And so things like that, and you know, and uh, I would buck up against that because, especially after having experience with Angel Steel, I would buck up against it. I could have handled it more diplomatically. And then, you know, there was also just the raw side of me that he had to deal with, which was, you know, I, I had come from this military family background, and I was, uh, you know, it it was a difficult situation. You know, I don't, I don't want to say too much about it because it involves too much of my private life. And right. plus, you know, I, I love my dad; and he's an awesome dude. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, there was a certain amount of uh, fight ingrained into me that mm -hmm. less time was spent cultivating, like, my ability to get along with other people out in the world. Like, you know, some people will spend that kind of time with their kids. More time was spent with, with on me, you know, how to fight, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, verbally and physically, but, you know, but. So it came out sometimes verbally with me, you know, mm -hmm. I didn't have good people skills because I wasn't taught good people skills. I learned them myself, you know, over the years, yeah. you, know, you, you just yeah. you figure out how to fucking behave, you know, totally. I go, this yeah. isn't working, you know, so let me try this over here. You know, Trial and error. Yeah, let me try what other people do. This seems to work for them, you know. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wait, not only is this, this work, it feels way better. It makes me I feel like a better person, you know, totally. I was combative. Um, and I would, you know, I could take a tone in a heartbeat, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Back then yeah. I, I could really, I could take a tone with you in a heartbeat and you would be like, mm. yeah, fuck, fuck you, you know, <laughs> <laughs> why are you talking to me that harsh? <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I could do yeah. it, you know, I could do it and I would do it occasionally. It would pop out of me. 
Yeah. I wasn't in control of it back then, you know, and that rubbed a truck wrong and rightly so, you know, mm -hmm. rightly mm -hmm. so. And I so, mean, coming, uh, coming from Mantis and stuff, I mean, that, you know, like what you've dealt with in the past and stuff, you had a really kind of gnarly upbringing mm -hmm. into bands and stuff. So, like, I could see that you kind of having that protection up or something, you know, something being like, okay, well, I'm not really sure in what, in what way you were referencing Mantis there. Yeah. You, you said the wrong name, Joe. Well, what's his name? What, what, what's my mess? Fucking up the name. Agent steel. Agent steel. Agent steel. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Just that whole situation. Fuck. I fucked that up. I like, um, the whole, the whole, that whole situation though, of just like the craziness that you got brought into this, the music scene. And like, I could see, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. And like that, a protection, you know, you know? Well, you saw how I bucked up about that, you know what I mean? Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I, I fought back against that and I ended up getting the upper totally. hand in the end. And, uh, but you know, I kind of had that attitude like, Oh, this is what the music, this, this is like, well, I've got experience being an asshole. So I, you know, it's yeah. not that I consciously thought I needed to be an asshole, but it just unconsciously yeah. came out of me because mm -hmm. this was how I was raised. It was how I learned to be. It was how I was taught no, to be, okay. you know, yeah. I'm, I'm the guy now I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a, I wouldn't say I'm a pacifist, not by any means, but yeah, you know, I'm not going to run out in the street and fight nobody unless I absolutely have to. You know what I mean? Yeah, unless totally. I'm defending house, home, and family. You know exactly. And you learn, you know? and and you mostly probably learn that from your previous self. That's what we all do. We yeah, all yeah, yeah. Real but I used to just haul off and hit motherfuckers, and and it didn't always work out good for me because I was small. Yeah. <laughs> all right. I was skinny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you know. Uh, I carried a few ass whippings from that, you know, and, uh, uh, but I didn't care. I, I was mad enough and someone said something, you know, bad enough to piss me off. You know, I, I, I punch them in the mouth. <laughs> right. Yep. Yep. And, uh, and every excuse to blow off some steam. It, you yeah. Know. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it, certainly by the time I got in depth, I was, I was over the physical part. I wasn't well, all that, you know, I had just, two years prior gotten in that massive fist fight with that guy that was working for Aiden Steel, you know, because I liked King Diamond. You know? Oh, King Diamond, that's so funny. Yeah, yeah. Dude. Like, and, uh, one uh, of the gnarliest brawls. Of, but, but, it, that's know, such I'm, a funny I'm story. Like, one of the gnarliest brawls I've ever had is over yeah. me enjoying a band. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and anyway, so, so mostly what got me in trouble with death was my mouth, you know, and, uh, yeah. and you know, and, and of course, you know, you gotta watch your mouth around. Now you know he's a big teddy bear, but Terry Brother could squash you. <laughs> you want <him> to? <laughs> 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 you know, Hulk smash, dude. You know, he's Terry a smash. Guy, but you know he could if you pissed him off bad enough. Was it? Was that geezer's? <laughs> was it? Was it? Was it geezer's kid? <laughs> No, Geez, not at all. Geez, okay, okay. Not someone to told Geezer me it was Geezer, Geezer Butler's kid, and I was like, No, oh, they, they happen okay. to have the no, same name, Terry Geezer Butler and Terry uh, Butler, but and they're both uh, baseball. Gotcha. But he's he's not related at all, you know. Okay, gotcha. That's all. That's no, that's I, how I, young I am. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, you know, uh, 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 you know, so you know, I might I minded my P's and Q's to a certain extent in death, but. Uh, Certainly, my mouth got me in trouble more than once, mm -hmm. and just little things like I would speak out, like you know, like for instance, Chuck took a when we were he getting ready to head out on the road. He, he, this guy shows up with him to practice one day, and he's gonna be our. Chuck is telling us this is gonna be our sound guy on the on the spirit on the tour, and I'm like, okay, cool, all right, seems like a nice enough guy, cool. And I didn't know that much about sound reinforcement back then, but I knew a little bit, and. I knew enough to tell if I was talking to someone who didn't know their ass from their elbow, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, it, w with regard to it. And uh, I got to talking to this guy and it was very clear to me. I was like, holy shit. I don't hardly know shit about running live sound, sound reinforcement. And I know orders of magnitude more than this guy. I at least know what a crossover is. I at least know what a compressor is. I at least yeah, know, yeah. you know, what a send is. You know what I mean? In a, mm -hmm. in a, like, this guy, I don't know, man. Maybe he knows. Maybe he knows what this stuff is, but he didn't know how to use it very well. And yeah. something about the things he was saying clued me into that. And so I said to Chuck, I, I pulled him aside and said, "Hey, Chuck, your friend seems nice, but man, he doesn't know his ass from his elbow when it comes to sound. We're gonna sound like shit." He got so mad at me. Oh, he was so fucking mad at me i thought i was gonna get fired right then and there describe his reaction just describe describe how you'd react to that 
Like, because uh, Chuck reaction of you telling him that, like, what did he do? Like, what was his, like? A stern remark, walk away, then broody and very just dark eyed towards you and and just want to talk to you and you just get the yeah. vibe. You know, that's totally. kind of what, what, what would happen. And yeah. uh, so I, I had, I had spoken up. Well, you know, first day of the tour, you know, we got devastation is opening up for us. And they got oh, this yeah. guy named Walt running sound for them. And they sounded fucking amazing. And then we sounded like shit. I mean, people in the audience were telling us, like after the show, oh, you guys were great and all, but man, your sound was really bad. Devastation That's sounded the worst. Good. So what <laughs> yeah, happened? Yeah. You guys, you guys' sound was messed up. And I was just like, <laughs> oh. And it happened that. the second night. Yeah. And I was like, man, I can't even say anything. Because when I tried to say something before to, to avoid this happening, I, I got, you know, got my head bit off and I got the silent treatment for, for up until, you know, for, for a couple of days. Now, if I say, see, I told you so now I'm really going to get it, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I kept my mouth shut and I was just like, fuck, we're suck We're sounding like shit. It sucks. And the uh, third day, Chuck said, Hey James, come here for a minute. And he pulled me aside and said, dude, we're sending Andy home today. We got him a Greyhound ticket. We're hiring Walt. He's going to be doing our sound. <laughs> You're like, fuck yeah. <laughs> so, you know, he so that was his way of I saying, I'm saying, sorry, or whatever. Not, like, we're you know, cool again. Not that, I, not that I was always right. You know, I, I, I certainly wasn't. But, you know, I was right about that. And, and fortunately for the quality of the tour, for the fan experience moving forward, and for our experience, you know, moving yeah. forward for the rest of the tour, um, we actually had a really good sound man and we sounded killer you know on the rest of the tour you're but... gonna bring a sound man with you that's your gatekeeper to the crowd you, you can know. be on your a plus game that night but if it doesn't translate, yeah, the sound sucks, you... he's your translator you know and that's i mean like... it's it's you guys surviving on the road too it's like if the if the crowd likes you then they go and buy merch and they participate and and you guys your life is easier on the road so if you guys sound like shit and they're like well, it was, they look like they were into it, but it's just a bunch of white noise. Then you're not going to get, you know, it's not going to be paying off at the end, you know, for yeah. a tour. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so anyway, that happens. And, and a number of other little things how like that happened here and there. Like at one point when we were recording the album, um, the guy who was going to be the manager came in uh, uh, and uh, had contracts he wanted us all to sign. Well, you know, those guys just kind of, maybe they skimmed it real quick, whatever they were, they were signing it. And I was like sitting there holding it. Like, I don't, I don't want to sign anything. I haven't read, you know? And so like, I told Chuck, I was like, I'm going to go in here and read it before I sign it. Oh, he was so mad at me for that. So mad. Yeah. And, uh, but I went into the other room and I sat there and read it and it didn't take me long to spot something that was fishy. This guy wanted to take credit for producing the album. He hadn't been there. The album Jesus. was very clearly being produced by Scott Burns. Yeah. And that was what we all understood the album was going to say. And that's what, when we wrote up the credits for the album, that's what we put produced right. by Scott Burns, you know? Cause you guys were there. You knew everybody involved, but in the deep in the language of this contract, it said that he's, that this guy is going to be credited with what the fuck? producing the album. And Scott would just be credited as an engineer. Wow. And uh, I was just like, Chuck, come look at this. And he was still so mad at me. And he came in with just such a look on his face. Like, yeah, what? And I was like, just read this. Just just read that. And if I'm, if I'm off base, I'll shut up, you know? And he sits there and reads it. And he, I could just see him going from mad to madder. He went from <laughs> mad at me to furious. That's yeah. the guy who wrote the contract. At the contract. And uh, they ended up tearing up the copies they signed. Damn, wow. and uh, you know, so, but there were lots of little things happen like that where he got mad at me. Some of them where I ended up being vindicated, and you know, some where I wasn't, you know? mm -hmm. <laughs> because yeah. I, because I was, I was guilty as charged. <laughs> I was being mm -hmm. a, an asshat, or you know, I guess there's like two very strong personalities. You're, you're That's gonna exactly say your it. piece. You know, yeah. I, I hate, I hate that terminology alpha. I hate it because yeah, I, yeah. I think it's, yeah, I, 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 I think it's like you can't take human biology and human behavior yeah, and no. compartmentalize it, it that neatly and cleanly yeah, but exactly. certainly two very headstrong males useful yeah. and headstrong and 
confident and stubborn were mm-hmm. butting heads. Exactly. And uh, Chuck was always going to win that because mm-hmm. it was his. Right. Yeah. And, and and very rightfully so. He had every right to, uh, to you know, have at least certain expectations. So, you know, there was some that, you know, I, I, looking back on, I, I wish he wouldn't have done those type of things. And I, and I, and I, and I'm proud of myself for standing up to them. Mm-hmm. Like being told I can't talk to this band or the other, you know, glad exactly. I stood up for that. And, I, and I'm sure that Chuck, if he were around today, would be, he would be sad that he, yeah, ever acted like that. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but it, all of this stuff led, you know, whether it was my fault or whether it was just sort of misunderstanding, you know, things like that, where, you know, maybe Chuck was at, at fault. They all led to only one logical conclusion, which was that I was out after the tour. So I decided to, you know, to, to get ready for that, to prepare for it. Mm-hmm. And uh, and one of the things I did to prepare for it was to reach out and call Scott Burns and let him know, hey, uh, so I'm not going to be in death anymore. You know, if you, you know, if you need. Got anyone? I don't know why I thought to call him. I really don't know why. I didn't know what he was doing. I didn't know whether he would give a shit. I, I didn't know whether he would say, oh, so you're not in death anymore. So there's no reason for me to talk to you. Bye. You know what I mean? Right, I, right. You know, I didn't know what he was going to do. He, you know, he's a way nicer man than that. He never would have done that. He's a great guy. But, but and, and yeah, I, it was just, I had such a rapport with him when we recorded Spiritual that I, wa- I wanted someone to, to reach out to and talk to about it. And so I thought of Scott. So I called him. I right? just called him at Morris Sound. And he was there. And he got on the phone with me. And I told him. And he goes, dude, dude. So he talked, dude, <laughs> bro. Bro, no, bro. Obituary right now, and they need a guitar player. You should come down. When are you going to be back in town? It's like I'm going to be there tomorrow. He's like, come, come to the studio, man. You know. Wow. You know. Damn. And, so they uh, maybe just they just told them told Scott that they need a guitar player, and then you decided to call Scott, and it was kind of like a aligning. Well, I don't know whether they told. Uh, uh, well, obituary was in the studio. They were act. They were in the studio recording the Jesus. album. They were already there, already recording it. I oh, love man. how Florida death metal <laughs> in the '90s sounds like Cali death metal in the 2000s, dude, bro. <laughs> yeah, it's got the, <laughs> it's the, co- it's the coastal. It's because we're close to the beach and it's <laughs> yeah. It's a sea well, turtle. you know, there's there's a lot of redneck accents amongst you know people in florida in general oh, but yeah. you know chuck had a very like i don't know stoner dude sort of like totally you know he kind of picked and, up and, some cali vibes like i'd been to yeah Antioch yeah he probably picked and, up when he was there you know because and i i you know i've lived here my whole life Antioch have been there since i was a child you know i've had family there and yeah he's he definitely i think picked up a little it was a very impressionable place over here. he was there no doubt you know yeah so, so he undoubtedly, undoubtedly picked it up. And, uh, um, you know, Scott, I don't really know his background, but he was very much not a redneck accent. Just a very laid back, chill dude, kind of dude, dude, you should come, on, come down. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, oh, no way, bro. Come on, you know, come down to the studio. So I came down and, and I, I ended up uh, getting the gig sort of right then and there on the spot. They didn't, you know, it was no audition or anything. It was just like, hey, you know, go record some solos <laughs> yeah they're the tracks are ready you know go, go ahead and record some solos i think i spent like you know like a day and a half you know, you know doing the solos and so, you know, a day and, and a half by that i mean like probably about six to eight hours one day going through and 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 uh a couple of hours on the next day so go through your process on that a little bit is is part of it uh freestyle improv is it um r- hearing it and wanting to just transcribe yeah. something before you do it how does that work well that that was only my second album that i had ever recorded and uh you know with the with the death album i had i had had time in rehearsal to sort of structure some of my solos like maybe about half of them get them pretty well structured what i was going to do maybe even more than that but there was certainly um some creation you know improvisation uh, you know, last minute changes when we were in the studio that just sort of came to me while we were tracking it. Like, oh, now that I've recorded this, I'm hearing this and instead of that, you know, and 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 so I was able to just sort of make changes on the fly. Um, mm-hmm. When it came to the uh, cause of death recording, I had no preparation whatsoever. I didn't even, I didn't know how to play any of the songs themselves. Um, mm-hmm. When I 
already had to be recording solos on them. And in fact, wow. I mean, this is this is kind of like a long little side. I didn't even have a guitar at that point because unfortunately I had gotten rid of my guitars I had when I joined Death because BC Rich had hooked me up with, with guitars. But when I left Death, those guys back. those guys did not no bc rich didn't the death guys did oh, God. <laughs> they you repossessed know, them the, you know i mean those, those guys have expressed uh you know you know you know different feelings about it you know i, I just no no animosity about that whatsoever you know I, I have more guitars now than i've ever owned in my life um so uh, you know i'm not sweating those guitars i i would love to yeah. still have them for the nostalgia of it you know because mm -hmm. um, i'm but uh but they kept them and and uh you know later on you know when i talked to bc rich they were like no they should have kept them those were yours we give those to you but you know what i'm going to do possessions nine tenths of the law i would have had to have taken them to civil court you know and and uh, i wasn't about to do that yeah, and, yeah. Uh, so i had no guitar you know but uh um, scott uh called uh mike davis from nocturnus and he brought down this see everyone thinks i recorded cause of death with that black warlock that I people always saw me live playing with with them you were but, playing that in that super cut too that i was watching. yeah yeah the, that black warlock that's what everyone thinks i recorded you know so many people said oh dude that black warlock sounds so awesome on your cause on your cause of death solos like really you're talking about live <laughs> ones right nah, yeah but the album too though like no nah, man that yeah. that was a that was like a like a, i don't even know what to call it like a midnight blue or like sort of race car blue sort of Charvel hmm. that that Mike Davis from Nocturnus brought down to the studio. <laughs> wow! And I, played, I played that, and uh, you know, the BC Rich sent me some more guitars. That's when they sent me that uh, that Black Warlock. You know, um, but, that's uh, a cool little tidbit, dude. A, yeah, the yeah. Nocturnus guys pulling through for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No doubt. And uh, uh, well, of course, I knew all those guys. I knew those guys. You know, from from the scene and from around and, and all that. Yeah. So we all, we all knew each other. So it was no. That might be a, a lesser known thing yeah yeah perhaps world you know, uh, I, don't, I don't know how many times i've told that or, or not or left that bit out i don't know but uh but yeah i just i had to record the soul so most of those were sort of made up on the spot that's not to say that i didn't compose them but i when i did composition i composed them on the spot i would yeah. say i didn't i what i didn't do was hey i'm just gonna improvise man you know to record you know, four or five tracks of that, and then you can cut it together later, you know, <laughs> cut the best bits together. You know, that's, that's what a lot of people do when they improvise on records these days. They'll just pick it up and just play right off the cuff, you know, right off the top of their head. No, you're like, in the beginning, I'm going to play this part. And, and then... record it, yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. what I did was I, I, I had Scott play the track, and I would just start playing stuff. So improvising, yeah. But then I would find things that I liked, and I would say, okay, I, I need to, I'm going to do that in the beginning, and then I would just sort of compose it. And it got to where, like, after the first solo doing that, Scott was just like, yeah, you know, hey, man, let me show you how to how to sh how the shuttle here works on the big remote control for the for the two inch machine. So I'm just going to put it in shuttle, put you on input, you know, and shuttle mm -hmm. it and it'll just keep rewinding and playing it over again. You know, take your time, figure something out. And once you're happy with it, come get me. I'll be out in the lounge, you know, watch a TV or whatever. And, uh, <laughs> and then I'll record you and you know, or eating wow. or whatever he was going to do, you know, on the phone with his with his wife or whatever girl maybe she was his girlfriend at the time i'm not sure you know he went and killed his time you know and, and yeah. so i would just sit there in the control room by myself and i just kept playing over the parts until i find things i like i would just improvise until oh that sounded cool and i would save it and you know in the mental clipboard and once i had the structure down and i knew what i was going to do i'd play it a few more times to get it under my fingers and then i'd call scott in and we'd go for takes yes composing yeah it's it's like a it's a really mm -hmm. fast compo i mean really i mean well there's for the time and then there's there's composing there's like you know it's like you working on all right this is cool this can work here this next yeah i mean in, in, pure, in, here. in pure improvisation you would be playing something different every single time it rolled totally exactly so i started off the first take or two was pure improvisation yeah but that then i would identify the bits that i liked right and then I would save those and as soon and, and repeat them. And as soon as you start doing that, it's it's composition and not improvisation. So That's it really would just a... go from improvisation to more less and less improvisation until it was completely composed. All you need is the little seed. You just need mm -hmm. one yeah, little yeah, seed. Exactly. Look, check out my headphones right now, guys. Uh, but you need <laughs> you need a uh, just one little seed that you can build in all directions after that. Once you get yeah. one little like thing planted, 
it, it's all just, I mean, you know, my metaphor that I'm going with right now. You water it, you know, and then it grows out in all directions. Dude, I can't believe I stepped on my headphones tonight. All right. So, um, that's rad as shit, dude. I love hearing that too. So that session gets done. And then what's the like plan forward? Like, are you in the band for sure? Yeah. In the studio? Well, well, kind of, you know, from, from the moment that I, from the moment that I got the gig, mm-hmm. you know, they, we sat down out on the, the tables in the lounge at, at Morris sound. And, you know, we were just discussing, you know, the, the particulars of, of, whether I was going to do this and what the, what the terms were going to be to, to a certain extent, you know, um, it certainly wasn't comprehensive, you know, but, uh, the one thing that they did cover, they said, look, we didn't want Alan to leave. He's our bro. We came up with him. We've been doing this with him for a while now. And he's our boy. We didn't want him to leave. He's worried. He's thinking about the future. He's having a baby. Yeah. He's, mar- he's married or getting married. I don't remember which. And he's got the baby and, uh, you know, this death metal thing, you know, he, you know, he needs a steady paycheck for his baby. He no one knows whether this is going to be successful or not, whether this is going to fly or not, whether Very we're going to get money or whatever, you know, he said, so, so he, he made the decision to go and, and that's why we called you in, you know, and he said, look, that they said, look, if, if he ever wants to come back, we will probably take him back. Mm-hmm. And they told me that first day. And so I knew that it was always a possibility. Yeah. And, you know, now I would say that I was, I had much more in common with Chuck and I had much more in common with, you know, I had much more in common with Chuck than I did with the obituary guys. Mm-hmm. I got along with them fine, you know, particularly at first, you know, but, you know, They were very much, you know, like, you know, good old Florida boys, you know, just wanted to smoke weed, drink beer, play death metal, have a good old time, you know, and, and I wanted to do some of those things. Yeah. But I also wanted to be very businesslike and very, you know, and I, and I, and I had goals and I, and I, I wanted things to, to be a certain way that they weren't necessarily ever going to be because that was their band and their band is the way that they wanted it to be. You know what I mean? So yeah. I was always a little bit uncomfortable. I didn't speak up about much though. I didn't speak up like I did in death. I had sort of learned my lesson about speaking up and I, I just wasn't good at communicating like that back then. I wasn't good at communicating how I was feeling. So mm-hmm. the things that I was unhappy with just built up. It right. was built up like a pressure in me. And, uh, you know, I, you don't need to go any, into any details. Just suffice to say there were things about the way business was done. Not that there was anything wrong with it. They all agreed to it and they liked it and it was their band. So more power to them. Right. But it wasn't how I wanted to do things. Mm-hmm. So, and with my lack of ability to express it or discuss it with them at the time, you know, I just didn't have those skills, you know, verbal skills and people skills to deal with it. So I clammed up um, and uh, it built up like a pressure and it came out. It just, it oozed out. I was not a happy camper yeah. 90% of the time that I was in obituary. My happiest time in obituary was recording those solos and then, you know, and then the album release. And, you know, there were the odd shows here and there that were great, but I was always so unhappy about just on a base level, the way certain things were being done that I'm more than positive. I wasn't the most pleasant person in the world to be around. I had my reasons I should not have behaved like I did. I didn't behave that way on purpose. I behaved that way because I was trying to put a clamp on my feelings. Yeah. And it wasn't working all that well. It's starting right. to steam up. You're like a steam. You're steaming. You're starting to steam yeah. and the pot. The pot's yeah. rattling. Yeah. Yeah. And it's yeah. kind of like a rubber band effect from the previous situation you had. You know, you were, you were open and expressive about Yeah. And I got, I got, on. I got smacked down for it. And that's so you, have, you recoiled in it to, and then it was, you tightened too far up, you know? Yeah. And it, it just led to me kind of boiling over. Mm-hmm. Sorry. I forgot how to drink a beverage. <laughs> <laughs> a 129 Arizona. 
<laughs> yeah. 129. <laughs> yep, completely forgot my beverage drinking skills. That is all good, dude. You drink uh, five I'll of those a day, it's an extra measures. dollar to your budget, dude. You drink five of those a week. Sorry, I said a day. <laughs> a day? <laughs> Adult, well, even if it, there's, there are people that drink five of those a day. Come on. And yeah, I've drank are. at least two of these a day for like 30 friggin' years. Yeah. Now, oh, man. I'm I not... don't have diabetes. No, I'm just saying that's and that's I've never had a kidney Everyone else in my family has had kidney stones. Well, have they you, all you, eat green uh, tea. So, were you ever an al- proof. Were you ever drinking alcohol and stuff? Like, did you like? Were you ever like partying I'm, I'm and drinking? I'm a very, uh, uh, I'm a very casual a, a drinker okay. and a very low, small amounts. Like, it yeah. doesn't take much to get me a buzz. And uh, with 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 a few notable exceptions in my life, I stop with the with that. Once I got the buzz, mm-hmm. I call it social lube <laughs> I got some yeah social yeah lubricant going right then, right. I, then I just nur- will nurse the same drink the rest of the night like I'll drink the first one or two pretty quick I start getting my you know my little buzz going Good and then I, 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 as soon as I have that I slow right down and I'll nurse the third drink for the rest of the damn night you know that's smart that's and very I've smart. always done that <laughs> yeah. you get, your, your metaphor <laughs> of social lube it just made me think like you just kind of slightly throw a little bit just enough lube in there but me and joel we like jump in yeah, a go vat of hard. lube we jump no, I, in I, I, I used to talk about like I, like i would come home from work and stuff from like a 12-hour day at work and we had a podcast i had a podcast and i've been 12-hour day i got i got six or like re, like today i got a few hours of sleep i do a 12-hour day and then i was like come, just walking with a 12-pack of the the stuff and i was like well it's Talking sauce. I don't know. Like I won't talk. talk. If I don't have, like I won't have any, if, if I didn't have anything to drink tonight, I'd be like, "Yes, thank you. I appreciate it." Like, Hello, how are you? I wouldn't be. Yeah, like, it, can, it can kind of it can kind of you know loosen loosen things up a little bit. But you know, you, it, yeah, it's it's like any sort of uh, thing like that. You gotta you gotta use it responsibly. Moderation or yeah. not. Or not. Or not. Yeah. If, yeah. If you don't, well, then you know. As long as then you're, just. As long as you're not you're hurting of, every, anybody you know, else, the and just of that, you know, more power yeah, to yeah. I mean, it was it's, it's for me. It's you know, like I've I've had a few drinks tonight, and there's people that if they have the same amount of drinks, they might be like, Bleh, like you know, like their motor skills are gone, and they're saying ridiculous stuff. Are you talking I'm, about me at the end of most of these? What are you talking about? Dude? <laughs> are you taking it no, no, no. I'm actually pacing myself. I pace myself on Legend Night, guys. If you go yeah. back, most Legend episodes, I I naturally makes me oh legend yeah, yeah. yeah we got james murphy you don't want to be yeah, yeah. Well, what, yeah. You gotta, what you gotta <laughs> you gotta understand is that i was but, but when i went into obituary i had been w- uh, with death when those guys were complete teetotalers except chuck who smoked weed wow. nobody else did anything and so i had sort of habituated myself to that like seriously in the death tour if we showed up and there was a case of beer in the dressing room we we did not have beer on our riders, so if there was a case of beer in the dressing room, it, like, more often than not, the individual beers ended up just slung down the hallway out of the dressing room. Because you guys didn't want to drink them. Yeah, just just. They did you smoke? Well, how was how, how was your weed I, I intake? Know, it was just uh, uh, immaturity, you know, immaturity. Like we didn't want to drink them, so we threw them out. Also, they, they, you know, they spent some brighter money on that. They drank, but I was, you know, I was I was along yeah. for the ride, you know. Uh, I, I've never been a big drinker, so it's easy for just as easy for me to not drink as it is for me to have a couple. Totally. Um, and uh, but uh, so I went into obituary and I was already, you know, I never had been a big drinker and I had gotten used to for the previous year not touching mm-hmm. alcohol. So, you know, so I was what was your relationship great. or is your relationship those, with those cannabis? Guys party, man. You know, those guys, those guys are partiers, man. They like to, yeah, they like totally. to have a little bit of fun, a little bit. Of, oh, know. No, I, yeah, I hung out with them at Psycho Fest. They're a little oh, yeah, bit, and more yeah, power yeah. to them, man. They, they, yeah, yeah. They, you know, if, if I had been a, a, a drinker even back then, I, I would have probably had a lot more, a lot more yeah. fun. But, you know, but. Uh, uh, what about weed? Did, how, how's you? No, how I, you I, I, I smoked in high school and I got over it in high school. Yeah. Yeah, like when I used to skip school in Germany, we'd go smoke hashish. Oh, okay. Maybe some from some Afghan, you know, blonde. Nice, you know, dude. Whatever, you know, some blonde stuff. Get some. Uh, oh, there's all. I don't even remember all the kinds. There's the kind rock of rock and hash, you know, kind of ruddy red color, yeah, like clay or I, something. Yeah, 
I gotta catch you guys off because uh, we gotta. Um, so James, we, we're on this thing called Twitch, and people like they they have a stream going, and they'll send all of their people here. And Kevin Mueller, who's on, you know, he's a uh, alluvial. Let's fucking he's sung for suffocation. One of my good buddies. He just rated us. Hey, so Kevin, thank what's you. Up? Yeah, hey, thank you, Kevin, thanks, for sending Kev, all your dude, folks here. Yeah. I appreciate that, dude. I'd love to have Kev back on, dude, with his uh, voice. Uh character what was his name dude he had a character that yeah what's your what's, what's the name fucking, him? he's got a, like a long island he's from the whole long island suffocation fucking scene like hey i don't know i can't remember. bobby it's bobby there it is. bobby dude yeah dude we gotta <laughs> yeah, bring bobby Bobby's back bobby. hey but i know fucking yeah. bobby <laughs> dude 100 percent, kev all right we're locking it in right now I'll, we'll be talking very soon we got to bring you and bobby back on the show <laughs> yeah. i know you guys have been very fucking active since the last time you guys been on i've been watching you no doubt i'll take you and on I, date. yes motherfucker we are for sure i will be hitting you up like literally tomorrow kev all right um so back on to james dude so all right after a bitch where it sounds like these two bands that you had um well no, you, I, I don't want to make it sound like no 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 that. you don't you don't know where i'm going i i'm, okay. I'm not saying anything <laughs> bad i'm not saying i'm not going any na it, anywhere it, it negative with what i was about no to doubt. say I, I, I promise you i wasn't going to go negative with what i was going to say but it sounds like these stepping stone situations for you are are bringing you to the point where you're like i need to just do my own shit yeah, no, I absolutely started writing the disincarnate material while I was in obituary. Right, and and and, and it totally makes sense. Just yeah. with what we've heard, nothing. Good. I'm not. I'm, I'm not saying. Like I said, we're not. That well, is well, you know, in what, the past what happened now. Was at, at some point after I had been in obituary for a while, like a, you know, I did three really long tours with obituary, and uh, and uh, after the after a couple of them, you know, we were home on a little bit of a break between it and the and the next tour, and uh, we were rehearsing or something. I th I think I showed up. And uh, it was just Trevor there. We were waiting for the Tardy Boys and uh, and Frankie. And so it was just like me and Trevor at the jam pad. And uh, 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 that's when Trevor asked me, you know, like, hey, you got any riffs? You got, you got some riffs? Now, when Chuck asked me that, I was in write music for death mode. You know what I mean? I had just yeah. learned four of the new songs. So I knew the direction of the album. And I was very much thinking that. And uh, and we were jamming, so I was able to just pull something out of my butt and fit it in, fit it in, you know. Yeah. And uh, just you know, come up with something on the spot that that worked. But this wasn't a jamming situation. Had we been jamming, I, I could have played something that fit a song if we were working on a song. But Trevor just asked me if I have any riffs. I said, Well, you know, not not obituary riffs. I mean, I'm, I've been working on the stuff I want to do as like a side project called I'm going to call it Disincarnate, and I, uh, it's yeah. very different. It's you know. Uh, very different than obituary and he, and he goes well let me hear some of it and i was like yeah okay so i played him some of the riffs i think i probably played him stitch of paradise burning him and i'm sitting here and gotten stiff go cold yeah 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 everyone knows that riff i don't need to play it i can't play it right now for some reason my hands are completely locked up um but uh you know i played some of those riffs for him and uh yeah. And it, 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 he just listened to him and was like shaking his head. And when I was done, he goes, yeah, those don't sound anything like obituary, man. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I told you that they weren't for obituary at all, you know, they're for something completely different. I just thought you wanted to hear them. But I think in his mind, he was check testing me then to see if I could write music for obituary. If uh, I was okay. someone they could write with. But that's not where my mind was. My mind was, oh, you want to hear riffs of my new project? Well, here they are. Yeah. Well, man, that is some serious wrist lock right there. <laughs> um, but but yeah, you know, so it didn't, uh, you know, and I never I never had the opportunity to compose music with with obituary. You know, had we been in a rehearsal rehearsal room in the rehearsal room together, and they had you know said, hey, here's this piece of song we got. You got something that'll fit here. I would have composed something right there on the spot that fit there. Yeah, I'm yeah right. doing that, you know, and it's something that I do all the time in my role as a producer these days. A lot yeah. of times, you know, bands just, uh, they got a pretty cool initial idea and then, you know, like a decent intro and they got a cool chorus, 
but the verse sucks. So yeah. I'll, I'll, you know, I'll help them compose just on the spot, help them compose a, a either a, a modification to the verse or a completely new verse, or, or maybe they got a great intro and a chorus and, and verses, but they don't have a chorus. So I'll, I'll help them pump up the chorus, you know? So I do that all mm-hmm. the time and I, I could have done it, but I, I never had the opportunity to do it. Um, mm-hmm. Just, you know, one day I came to rehearsal because I mean, I couldn't reach anybody. So I, I had no confirmation that we were, were going to have rehearsal that day. No one was answering the phone back then. It wasn't that big of a deal when no one answered their phone or no one responded to you because, you know, people had to be home to get the call. Yeah, <laughs> and, yeah, yeah. And, uh, 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 Leave a message. So I was like, well, you know, I couldn't reach any of them. So I'm going to just show up because it's, this is our normal day. It's one of our normal days. So I don't want to not show up. So I'll show up. And uh, I showed up and I could hear them already jamming. And uh, I didn't immediately snap to the fact that there was more than one guitar. Uh, coming out there. So I got out and, uh, and, um, and at, right about that time, Frankie comes out and he's like, looks at me and he goes, Oh, Hey James. I was like, Hey dude, what's going on? And he's just like standing there going, uh, cause me and Frankie always got along great. Um, the whole yeah. time I was in the band and for all the years after I was out of the band up until he, you know, un- unfortunately passed away um tragically you know uh, it's, that's still uh, uh still uh, rough to think about but uh right but he was he was my my closest friend and you know the guy that i got along with the best mm. in obituary um maybe he was just the best at uh <laughs> you know at, at, at dealing with me i don't know um <laughs> but uh uh someone uh, connected with yeah yeah, we can, we connected, you know, we, we understood each other and, uh, uh, was, he wasn't a, a laid back Florida party boy. He, you know, he was a New York kid, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I identified much more with him and his just personality in general. Um, so, but so I, I didn't, you know, he was standing there being quiet. So I was just, well, I want to put this guitar down and go inside, you know? And I open up the door and walk into the room and, there's Alan West playing through my amp, no less. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> like your equipment. And Jesus so I, I was just standing there going, well, I guess Alan decided to come back, huh? <laughs> Damn. Damn. So I just, said, I just said, hey, yeah, well, you know, no big deal. It is what it is. You know, no, nobody needs to say anything. I'm just going to pack up my stuff, you know. Did you take yeah. your amp with you? Oh, of course. Like, get, oh, yeah, yeah. You, take your, you don't no, leave your amp. There's plenty of amps okay. there. I'm sure that they can. That's an awkward moment, too. Like, uh, can you please unplug from my Yeah, thing dude, I couldn't uh, even swear right now that he was actually playing through my amp. And just, you know, it was there. It was that's behind the memory. It was one of those yeah. moments where you're just tunnel vision. It's like, I mean, yeah. a lot of people, they relate uh, bands to relationships and stuff. So it's very equal to, like, you have kind of this, like, loose girl you're dating, and then she's with her ex. And you, she walk in, and you're like, oh, yeah. Well, I kind she of expected always, this. But. Yeah, yeah. She, it's like like if you were dumb enough to 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 invest in a relationship with a girl who told you that, hey man, yeah. when my ex gets out of jail, <laughs> I might start banging him again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Go, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, whatever. I'm going to show you. Around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. <laughs> you know, and uh, uh, but but you know, you know, those guys were they were very <laughs> forward in the beginning, you know, to tell yeah, me yeah. that Alan might come back, but you know, they were a little bit. I don't know. I don't know why they didn't tell me to that point. Maybe they were checking out to making sure that it, that Alan would be able to do it. That that his time off from the band hadn't uh, hurt him. You know that. Yeah. Was, you know, we were all very young, and it wasn't that long. It was like a year or so. You know. So I don't really know what the motivation was not to tell me at that moment, but they didn't, and so I found out. I found out the hard way. <laughs> but it wasn't completely unexpected because we had had success. Money was being made. Um, bills at home were, were able to be paid at least by some of the guys. Um, so, uh, you know, it was almost a no brainer that Alan would go, Oh, well, well, crap. I, I, maybe I fucked up. There there is money there. I will be able to support my family. I will be able to pay for my child, you know? So I think, I tend to think it was something like that that happened, you know, and, there's absolutely no ill will between me and those guys. I like all those guys, man. You know, they're, they're cool dudes, and and uh, you know, I you know, 
uh, you know, I love their new guitar player. Uh, I say new, he's been in the band for what a decade now. I don't know, a long time. <laughs> yeah. um, that is, in our terms, it's new. It's kind of like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know, Kenny, you know, Ken, 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 yeah, Ken yeah. Kenny's awesome, man. He's he's a really uh, fun, cool guy, and he's uh, and he's a good player, you know, yeah, and uh, um, and you know, and he just he fits right in with those guys like a, a fucking puzzle piece, you know, right. so um, you know, uh. And, you know, and Terry, you know, Terry's, Terry's my bro from, from way back. And, and, you know, I, I, I still, you know, I, I respect all those guys and, uh, and, uh, and I get along great with all those guys. Great, dude. I love that. That's right. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. So talk about what, how you move forward from that though. Like, okay. So you, that... well, you know, I had already, I already had my disincarnate thing going. So yeah, it was just, I just, what I did was I called Roadrunner Records and said, Hey, so turns out this side project thing I mentioned to you once that no, you, you weren't that interested in because it was just a side project and the side projects don't sell you know <laughs> well <laughs> it's going to be my main band i'm going to do yeah. it for real you know and uh and they were said well damn well let us hear something so that's when i made the demo tape with the drum machine and the bouncing back forth between the two tape decks <laughs> <laughs> and that <laughs> that impressed him enough to to uh, uh to to uh, get me to go to Morristown to do a, uh, a three song demo, which was the soul erosion demo in 1992. Um, do you have, do you have that first de the double cassette version I do, somewhere? But only, only on cassette tape. And I'm, wow. I'm, I, I want to make sure I'm set up and that my cassette deck is clean and ready to go. Cause I, I don't think I'm going to get too many oh. passes on that tape. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. I, I want to try to, digitize it into into pro tools and 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 have it digitally available because be ultimately i'd like to offer it as uh like a little little bonus thing too oh dude that's know, so. i eat that stuff up dude so you got yeah. one fan already ready to go right here oh me too <laughs> cool dude you would be surprised how close in some cases my program drums were to what ended up on the album so I remember, you know, when I, when I when I finally got Tommy, you know, and and he he had to learn the songs from uh, uh, initially from those demos. He was he was learning the songs when I already you know had gotten Alex Marquez to come in and play. Because Alex Marquez was just a monster, man. He he nailed that shit in no time. Like you know, I, I gave him the same tape, and he came up with stuff, and he just threw it down in the studio like it was nothing. Um, but Tommy also had the that tape I made with the drum machine, and he was learning it. So. When it came time to go do the record, you know, in some cases he was copying a little bit of what Alex did, but you know, on those three songs. But in in, in many cases, he uh, was referring more to what I did in the drum machine demo, and I was just like, "Hey, mm -hmm. Tommy, you know, you can." That, I'm not precious about those parts I program, man. They're just placeholders for me, just to give the general over overall idea, yeah. you know, the yeah. sort of outline. Said so you can. You could be creative there, and, and Tommy was just like, "Oh, you got to understand about Tommy. He's, he's, he's basically Cajun man. He's basically Adam Sandler, Cajun man. Really nice guy, super super cool, chill dude, full on Cajun man. Like, you know, like you ask him, "Hey, Tommy, what's your favorite band?" Civil Cajun. <laughs> what other bands do you like, Tommy? Immolation. <laughs> very, very much Adam oh Sandler. Uh, but uh, 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 Tommy was like, well, well, you know, uh, Jim, you know, I like the parts you recorded, bro. I, I, I like the way you program. You know, it's not cool to me. You know, it's like, oh, okay, man. <laughs> All right on. Okay. I mean, just know that you're free to create here. You know? <laughs> but, so Dude, like my, freaking, my broken you know? headphones just flew off of my head because I threw my head back <laughs> in laughter on that, dude. Oh yeah, uh, and uh, uh, also, also, I like incantation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry, sorry, Tommy, I love you, bro. That's amazing. Uh, Holy shit, yeah. love it. And, and Tommy oh, came up with great parts. What, like on the other songs like, that, that weren't demoed, Tommy came up with great parts. You know, and what I love about Tommy's parts on the, on the record is he's, he's... I mean, I challenge you to find a blast beat on that album. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I'm really happy about that. I don't hate blast beats. Yeah. But I like it that we made a death metal album at that time with basically no blast beats on it. I didn't even put that together. I, I, know I that... heard that as a complaint 
There's no blast beats on it. <laughs> it's no blast beats on it, and that's cool. That's one of the cool things. Fine, yeah. Yeah, uh, dude. There, there, there's also no freaking pig squeals on it. Get over it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I mean my brother comes from the old school, like like late eighties, nineties. You know, my older brother, uh, death metal uh, scene, and he was like, that shit was what he was like. This is he would, he's all take this album. Like it was like a blessing to me. Mm -hmm. Who's your album? He was like this. He was a like, DSI. Awesome, things. Man. Yeah, he was like, like you guys. He that was the number one thing for him. It was like this is my favorite one though. So this is Disney all the cool it. ideas and and like the whole, kind of pushing things forward. The no blast beat thing is awesome because it actually reminds me of just you're in a genre and you're like and then you you're you're so good at it, like have like such a good style at it that. Like basically, you could tell people at the end of it, like, there did you find a blast beat in there? And it was like, oh shit, what? There was no blast beat. You know, like they're looking for yeah. that thing, but they didn't. They were so enveloped in the album, they didn't care. It's still death metal, but they were they had no idea there's no blast beats. You know, like they were so loving it. You know, Dude, it's this the, may, this uh, may seem like a non sequitur, but uh, we're sitting here talking about you know brutal death metal and blast beats versus no blast beats and this that and the other and yeah i'm just sitting here unconsciously for some god i just realized it after i played it the melody to happy together by the turtles <laughs> hell yeah dude <laughs> that's good <See? laughs> no <laughs> i told my uh i told my coworker this week because i listen to a bunch of different styles of music and Oh, yeah. I just realized that sometimes I'll have points where I'm like, oh, our guest has a very extensive list. I'm familiar with a lot of it, but there's certain things that I got to listen to, too. So I'm just like, man, I got to listen to a bunch of fucking metal, dude. I got to <laughs> I do. A, I got to do metal and do metal podcasts, dude. Like, I don't not do. Really. It's like I don't. That's not the main source of music that I listen to anymore. I mean, it is it, when I get like the the bug, but like on a normal week, metal is probably twenty percent. What are you into? Stuff like winter? <laughs> no, I listen to a lot of like jazz and hip hop and weird avant garde shit. And oh, I mean, like the doom stuff. But yeah, oh, I listen. To oh, you jazz. you're not you. That's what yeah. you listen to is like doom metal stuff. No, no. Uh, well, yeah, I do like doom. Doom metal. Absolutely, yeah. I like doom. But uh, um, I was just. I have a very eclectic listening taste. I listen to jazz, like mm -hmm. everything from bebop to fusion. Mm -hmm. um, totally, I love it. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm not a big fan of like, like that, like New Orleans style. Like, or you know, this week or today, after I listened yeah. to uh, spiritual spiritual healing for the I don't know three hundredth time in my life, I uh, that's it. I got uh, a video from a friend of a guy who is doing tabla introduction, and that made me want to go to listen to Shock Tea with John. Dude, you Lothian. have no idea you're, what you're saying right now. Okay, so Lothian. today, yeah. so today, Shock Tea announced they're going on tour with John McLaughlin and Zaki Hussein, and it's going oh, on that's sale. Awesome, man. It's going on sale on the 17th on St. Patrick's Day. And it's in September. But, Synchronicity, yeah. Synchronicity is a <laughs> real fucking. I was thing. literally, I was literally about to tell you about the, like, yeah, about like Shakti was one of the. Like, I saw that when I was a kid with my my mom's all check this. You like progressive crazy shit? Check this shit out. And, and I haven't listened to Shakti in like a yeah. long time, dude. I love that album. Natural yeah. Elements is like my favorite totally. shit. Uh, We're all going together. I'm I I where uh, yeah we, no September. dates are, okay okay yes yes. Yeah. I, I really I have confidence that at least one of my kids was conceived to that album. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice, nice. I mean, even seeing um, I saw you know like Stanley Clark a, a couple months ago doing a like a Chick Corea tribute set, and I was like, this is so. I was like, my whole I was like in chills the whole time. I thought I had the flu because I was just like, this is so awesome. But everyone that was there was kind of like, oh, these are like all up. And I just had I just had like a death metal. I just I was I'm gonna go in a death metal thing because I don't want to do the whole like everyone in their ties at SF jazz going like ooh me too you know like I didn't want any I didn't want any of that stuff. Just like I was like I'm gonna go the most abrasive thing because I just feel uncomfortable and this I, makes I me feel better. Oh, you, guys, you guys have I, referenced Holdsworth and you're talking about fusion and stuff. Um, oh, Holdsworth, you know, on my, yeah. Uh, on my first solo album, I did uh, Red Alert from uh, the Tony Williams oh, Lifetime, which originally had. Uh, 
Holdsworth on guitar. And I was uh, fortunate enough in my life to be able to meet both Holdsworth and Tony Williams. Damn. uh, Wow. Pass, you know, pass along copies of that. You know, I don't know if they ever listened to it, but it yeah, sure, sure made me happy to be able to, uh, yeah, get let's, that opportunity. What's like a good, like, what's like the meanest, like, jazz fusion album? Like, it's like, like okay, Aldi Mila Casino, or like, you know, like, or Return to Forever, or whatever. Like, like, what's like just the, me- like, yeah, like one, the most aggressive, aggressive Mono Birds of Fire. Or, yeah. Oh, okay. Mono is pretty Mono Vichu. Yeah. Yeah. That gets okay, pretty aggressive. Yeah, what, would you, what would you what you say? Well, yeah. for James, this question's for James, not for us. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> if you just were to well, uh, I have uh, answers. Ever, I have answers. Have you ever listened to Coliseum Two with Gary Moore? No. Or Strange no. New Flesh or Savage or anything like that. That's no. That was Gary Moore playing Fusion, and it's Damn. pretty awesome. Nice. Um, Damn. but uh, I'm also a huge fan of Scott Henderson, Tribal Tech. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. oh yeah! Oh yeah! Yeah, yeah. Like Some nasty shit on those albums, and uh, totally. yeah, just love it. And uh, of course, all of Holdsworth's, you know, output. Yeah. yeah, amazing stuff. But, I uh, cherish my hold Holdsworth box set. And dude, dude one one of my my first ever fusion experience. I call it fusion. I don't know whether it's generally categorized as that by most people, but mm-hmm. you know, my introduction introduction to. Uh, Jeff Beck, Lead Boots. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Um, God damn it, I was close. I was going to say yes oh, for a second, and I went... Well, I, I threw a couple of clams in there. They probably threw you off. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That was sick. I mean, oh, Jeff Beck... Did you know Jeff Beck, like... Didn't he, like, show, like, Jimi Hendrix shit or something? Probably he, did. Like, yeah, he, like, there's, like, stories I was watching, because when he passed away, I, I went down this rabbit hole of videos, and uh, he, he showed Jimi Hendrix a lot of these, like, weird techniques that he was doing. And How old would know- Jimmy be today? I, I don't know. Alexa. I'm just kidding. I have, I have <laughs> she no idea. Tell you. <laughs> you she like would talk? fucking tell you right now. Dude. Yeah. 78. He's old what? Alexa, how old would Jimi Hendrix be today? Yeah. 80 years old. 80. Damn. See, oh, damn. Old, yeah. Interesting. So but how was Jeff, Jeff Beck? Beck? How that means... old is Jeff Beck then? Yeah, Jeff Beck was, was 70, I think. Oh, okay. 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 <laughs> maybe maybe a little older. Maybe like maybe 77. I know sevens are involved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Definitely. No, he I mean Jeff Beck didn't know any music theory too, or no, knew very little too. That's what's really fucked up about him is that he no way. Yeah, it's, it's, that, that's what I watched on the no rabbit way. hole videos. They were like talking it was like him and Paul McCartney or something that's talking. True. He was like, You don't know any theory, You're like what the fuck? And like he's like, yeah, Dude, did you just, did you read uh Gilbert? You just made his Alexa go off, Joel. <laughs> Yeah. Alexa. Yeah, that's pretty funny. <laughs> In the podcast, you just start setting people's Alexas off. But... Alexa, Alexa, make a fart noise. Penetration porn now. <laughs> no, don't do that. <laughs> yeah. Uh-oh. <laughs> have to cut that out. <laughs> okay. But no, uh, mine mine's going bananas right now. But um, she answered. <laughs> <Jeez>. oh, <laughs> But yeah, no, that's uh, that's insane. I mean, Jeff Beck was, you know, I may have to get going pretty soon, guys. I'm sorry, yeah, yeah, we'll, we can start wrapping this up. No, dude, I, I know it's very hours. late for you, dude. Yeah, um, yeah, thank you for hanging out. I appreciate oh, no problem. No problem. Yeah, I mean, I've enjoyed it, I've enjoyed it. Yeah, it's a good time. Awesome. Because these um, things are always like sort of an opportunity to you know, tell two sto- new, you know, tell cool stories, yeah, you know, connect with new people, and you know, and you know, bury your soul a little bit, you know. And one thing, one yeah, thing, because I remember you were good. One thing I was I was I was peeing and usually when I pee I come up with an idea I want to talk to you about, <laughs> but um it was because of these stories and stuff I was sitting there like this is so fucking awesome I even texted Casey this is so having such a good time hearing these stories, um I feel like you know you're doing the YouTube my Alexa is going nuts right now I don't know what the fuck I said to it, but um I think <laughs> the um like you know you're, you're you're doing the the jam video or like the playthrough videos and stuff i think like you bringing on like an old, another old school death metal guy on your own thing and just talking would be fucking amazing like that would be like someone from the era of, you know back in the day when you guys were doing things and if you just sat with them and had them do what we're doing kind of and just like yeah these, sto- these, these are uh, these are all good ideas 
Yeah, yeah. I and then just show them like the old tricks, you know, or old <laughs> like things that everybody is. Oh, sorry, Casey, go ahead. I'm sure you have a better point than I. Because the even, right even like mixed with your like the lesson idea of the YouTube stuff. Like, what if you just like had your guitar and you're just like talking to some person and you know just going over old. Yeah, have it like plugged in where you can hear like, like everything yeah, you're yeah. doing. Like, that'd be kind of a like, new cool thing, you know. I don't know. Here's the the weird thing about uh, one of the weird things about getting older for me that I've I've noticed. Yeah. I actually, when I'm properly warmed up, I actually play better than I ever have. Like my, my picking, everything is way better than it ever was. Mm -hmm. Um, sick. Um, but, uh, if I like sit in a weird position or anything like that for a minute, I get so cramped up and locked up. I have to completely warm up all over again. But once I get warmed up, I'm, I'm on fire these days, you know, I can play better than I ever have, but yeah, just then oh, yeah. I tried to play and my hand just said, fuck you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It just stops. That's because well, I was sitting there holding my hand, you know, down here in a weird position. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, that's getting so old. Before, before we end it, I, no matter what, I could bounce up from whatever and, and play fine without the slightest bit of warm up. I, I can't do that anymore. I got to warm you've up. Got a, but, you've got a guitar in your hands for three hours. Like, what, what's what's your normal, like, I, I, you know, right now, what's your practice regimen? Like, I mean, to kind of end it and wrap things up, like, what honestly, is like, yeah, go for it. This didn't happen until COVID. Mm -hmm. Um up until covid for years i played because you know i'm a, you know i'm a studio musician so I, I play on people's records you know sometimes yeah. credited yeah. for like a guest solo here and there sometimes uncredited playing like 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 all the rhythm guitar or all the you know you know all the overdub guitars and sometimes even the bass you know yeah, um, yeah. so I'm, I'm playing all the time in, in that capacity but I tended because of that, I tended to really only play because I had so much other stuff to do that didn't involve playing and all the editing and the mixing and just the recording, you know, um, I tended to really not pick up the guitar unless I needed to for something that I had to do. Like I had to do a guest solo for someone. Hey, I'd, I'd, I'd warm up for, for an hour or so. Then I'd start tooling, fooling around with the track and then I'd lay something down and then I'd be done. I'd put the guitar down. I wouldn't pick it up again until... I had to play another solo or, 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 or something else on someone's record, you know, that was, yeah. I, I rolled like that for years, um, like 15 years probably. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so it was playing enough to keep my chops and abilities up, but not enough to like move forward to get better at anything. Mm -hmm. And, uh, certainly days would go by sometimes without me touching a guitar. Um, cause I was just busy, you know, with a damn mouse and a you know, keyboard, you know, pluck it away on you know other people's music and pro tools you know but but uh uh once covid kicked in you know the in-person production stuff went out the window and it just happened to coincide covid coincided with a something that was very fortunate for me when covid happened because yeah my work got cut because there was no in-person production anymore and because of that, there weren't going to be, you know, there's a certain amount of mixed stuff coming in, but that was going to be a trickle too, you know, as, you know, all that would be left, you know, would be stuff that was recorded already, you know, before COVID or that got recorded all remotely by everybody and sent in, you know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, so I knew I was going to have some time on my hands, but it, it, it was very fortunate that it coincided with me paying off my house. Mm -hmm. um, I paid off my house right before COVID hit. Oh. And, uh, so I didn't have a need to work as hard. I didn't have as, you know, this giant monthly nut hanging over my head that I had. Yeah, to, the monkeys on the back to, to get. And so I was able to relax a bit and say, you know what, stuck, stuck anyway. Just can't do anything. Just gonna kick it, you know, and just do whatever feels natural to me. If I want to read books, I'm gonna read books. If I just want to sit and listen to music with my headphones on. I'm gonna do that. I want to catch up on TV shows or movies. I'm going to do that. Yeah. And I, I was just, I'm going to do whatever the fuck I yeah, want to you're do. You're doing, you're doing, it turns you. out, it turns out what I wanted to do was sit here for about four to five hours every night and play guitar. And that's what I've done. Since, Hell ever yeah. since. So, so I'm getting, I'm getting well, blown up James about like, we have two main questions. Dis, that... Discarnate album. There's going to be another discarnate album. I'm getting that over and over again. Oh, I knew that question wasn't too far away. 
Um, <laughs> we need to know. I want to do it. Um, okay. I'm actually been talking to the other guitar player from Disincarnate, Jason Carmen. What's up, Jason? Nice. Um, uh, in fact, I think I got a message from him. I got a reply to that I just noticed earlier today. Did um, you? Sorry. Uh, so uh, <laughs> I think that uh, yeah yeah sorry about that Jason um, I will get back to you uh, yeah we're talking about getting together and seeing what comes out of it and uh, awesome. if it seems like awesome. you know music is flowing from it then 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 we'll definitely do it you know fuck yeah but here's the thing I don't want to force anything and this is the reason why it hasn't yep. happened to this point you know I'm not going to force it I'm not going to do it just to do it I'm not going to do it for the sake of doing it because everyone asks, I'm not going to do exactly. it because, you know, I'm not going to do it as a quarter, you know, and pe what people love to say, Oh, no, 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 fuck that new album, man. The originals, the shit, man. Fuck that new album. And they'll yeah. inevitably invariably fucking pop out with this old nugget. Right. It's a money grab. It's a cash grab. Uh, yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> let me tell you something, folks. There's no fucking money in death metal. So shut <laughs> yeah, up. exactly, dude. It's a change. You're trying to get a change grab. Like, like you have any change? Oh, yeah. Change. Yeah. 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 No, no it's got to be it's a loose change art. grab. Is what it is. <laughs> yeah. No, for sure. You know, and you know, that's money's obviously sure. not a motivation because there isn't any really for death totally. metal. Sure, sure. We'll try to sell some merchandise and we'll try to you know uh, raise yeah. some money and we'll, uh, you know, dude, but the whole the reason why people blah blah blah, but you know, no dude. one's gonna get rich off of it no one's gonna dude. pay their bills off of it dude okay yeah. i have to stop it everything is, right now. You know? not death, death metal it's debt metal dude exactly debt metal yeah debt metal dude. um oh, but you know, i was so, gonna say know, what i, I wanted really, to say to that was just i read that and you read it on the daily with some band that's come back and did a comeback album oh it's a cash grab shut the fuck oh, up i have a cash grab for death metal it's like yeah there's <laughs> got to be cash in the first place <laughs> for it to be a cash grab the real reason why people are talking about yeah. disincarnate today is because it was never a cash grab that came from the heart from you guys at that time. time. Yeah. You that's know, exa what I'm that's saying? exactly right. Yeah. It's it's the grooviest fucking metal to come out of Florida at you know, from that whole scene. You know, I, I would say obituary too, but I'm just saying for like the melodic groove, like meld for me and i'm sure for a lot of my homies i know gilbert would agree with me on this he's in the chat it's it's one of those like perfect combos like the perfect peanut butter chocolate combination you know what i'm saying and that's what that that album has always been to me is just like the perfect album to groove to you know what i'm saying and I'm glad um, you think so, man. I appreciate and, and that. And no, but and and that turned into my opinion about it. But really, I started saying what I was saying on the fact that that came from you guys first. There was no money involved. You guys were just yeah. expressing yourself. So. It, it, it started, and out now people just, are talking uh, about it three day, three decades later. You know, it, it started out as a as an idea I had for a side project while I was in obituary that I thought maybe. Some small label might put out if Roadrunner didn't want it, and that, that it would, you know, you know, diehard people would get it, and that would be it. I, I didn't, you know, I, I certainly never imagined it would be, you know, garnering the accolades it ultimately, you know, has over the years. You know what I mean? Certainly, it didn't, uh, you know, it didn't set the world on fire when it first came out. You know, and uh, the tour itself was very difficult. We had some some successful shows, but we had some, some really just awful shows, you know, where, uh, you know, it was very clear that, you know, that tour that we did for that disincarnate uh, for, for dreams of caring kind is the only tour we ever did. Um, and, uh, it was a U.S. tour. It, we never even completely completed it. Cause there were a couple shows out in California. We just couldn't even make it to just financially. We couldn't afford to get there. And, uh, uh, because we we lost money the the entire freaking tour um you know i forget where i was going with what point i was headed towards i originally did have a, a point i was headed towards but you know that that's what it was it was just uh something that was uh very hard to do but very rewarding on the on the musical side and that's what i 
initially thought it would be just something that I that I needed to get out of my system, but I didn't think it would be something that would, you know, get so much recognition all these years later. And I, I do remember what I was going to say. It, it, that tour is one of those tours that, you know, when you talk to people now, way more people saw it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we're actually you, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, it's one of those like, yeah, it's been telephoned through time, and now everybody wants to latch on to it. You know? Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I mean, I, I just remember shows where there were a couple of shows out in where the hell ever. You know, I don't even remember the the exact places now, but I remember at the time that, like, dude, I remember. I think I remember every single person that was there. You know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you could count them on on you know two three hands. You know, you, I, I've already been contacted by three times that many people tell me they were at that show and how much they loved it. Yeah, yeah. Um, fuck. Well, you were outside the park a lot then because I didn't see you. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, uh, 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 you know, well, we were on fire on that tour. We played well, you know, we were, we were, we were killing it. You know, the videos are literally just on fire. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's like, it's kind of common for you guys in that era at that time like you get a lot of you guys were just ahead of your time so the appreciation that you guys are getting for your art is later on including coming on this episode and and realizing that the younger cats which we're almost 40 so we're not that young anymore but yeah, our generation snappers our generation I'm was 40. fueled by your generation. You know what I'm saying? Like we're almost 40. So we were in our teens when we were coming across to you guys, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. and I, yeah, I'm just, well, very... I was in my early twenties back then enough set. Yeah. And, yeah. and me, Joel and Casey started, well, I started working with these guys in my early twenties too, which is just this time that, is very nostalgic for any human in general, but we yeah. are blessed. Time in your life when you're invincible, We're... you think? Yeah, <laughs> yeah it totally. is definitely yes. For sure. yeah. For sure. yeah. <laughs> I still am. I still am. Well, you know, in, in, in my early twenties, you know, in our early twenties, we were like uh, I, I like to make this analogy. Early twenties, you're like a, a racquetball. Throw it, it hits the ground, and it bounces right the fuck back up, right back yeah. in your face. Right. Yeah. You know. Uh, you know. I. You guys are at the age now where you're kind of more like a a, a partially deflated basketball. It's not really that fun <laughs> to dribble with. Don't I, make me don't I, make I, me ball 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 ball. my head again. Ball ball. Ball. <laughs> ball I hit the ground and I sink about three inches into it, and, and I yeah, get back yeah. up for a while. <laughs> it's like we, we got a bounce, but you got you got to slam it at the ground. But we got a little there's a bounce there. You can yeah, yeah that's what I'm saying. You guys got a bounce that. left. So my, my, mine's gone. I love that. <laughs> oh man, what a great analogy, man! That's awesome. Well, all right, should, we should wrap it up there. He's, you, I'm so thankful for your, all the time you gave us tonight, James. Kim sure. Sushi's getting well, we, we really, you know, we we covered like my my first three professional bands, and we we delved into the fourth one. Uh, so James, if, yeah. if you wanted this to do another thing. one, to, to oh, to cap it off, exactly what we're asking. asking. Yes, because we, I awesome, do man. definitely want to get into your solo albums and what you were going through, all that. Please, James, I would love to continue talking to you. Yeah. We'll figure out a time. Yeah, for you yes. to come let's back. do another one in a month or two or three, whenever you think wow. you're, Dude, super down. Your, 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 your viewers slash listeners might be, you know, down to. Uh, I know for a fact that our community is going to love this episode, James. They're going to love this episode and they're going to want a lot more of you for sure. Because sure. we're still in the 90s, guys. We haven't even hit Testament. <laughs> you know, like, fuck, dude. All right. No, but I love this. I love this very much, dude. And James, you're, you're a rad motherfucker, dude. And Joel oh, cheers, and Casey, That's great story, you're a rad man. motherfucker. Dude, story, dude. Yeah. I'm so that happy awesome. that I get to hang out every cheers, single week with you guys. And, yes. Dude, we missed the, we missed the professor. We'll, we'll he will be here once again but all right let's wrap it up real quick with the plugs battleforgecoffee.com get your coffee what oh yeah yeah sorry who do we raid uh kim sushi kim sushi so Love you give guys. us a little uh i have no idea mike gilbert said to rate him so it's a all right <laughs> trust gilbert go there 
if you if you try oh, they're, they're already there they're already there so just do your, oh, your, okay. do your thing for the listeners later oh they don't even hear me then the people that are over there yeah, they're, they're don't gone, even hear gone. me anymore okay for Wrap fuck up. you guys uh have a good time for the rest of your night all right but seriously listeners we have a blast doing this for you every thursday battle forge coffee cali death podcast if you want to buy shirts um at james murphy producer on facebook and youtube you said right yep and then uh, on, on instagram it was james f murphy someone put in the yeah i think someone probably. said james f murphy you, you yeah, might probably. know better than me I, i'm just I'm type in so james murphy about, and it's going to be being yeah. active on instagram i need to i need to uh fix that totally totally oh, we yeah. actually get more we get more uh traction in instagram than we do in facebook so you might want to think about that it's kind of like idiocracy. We're getting we can't like read words anymore. We just, well, just need go, pictures. Go to, go to my YouTube. That's where I'm gonna YouTube. You know, YouTube. You know, that's YouTube. That's where all well, the real solo, shit's gonna happen, solo, anyways. And, you know all this stuff and the, you know oh, yeah. moving forward. Like, so subscribe YouTube, to James, James Murphy's YouTube. Producer on YouTube. James cool, Murphy man. producer. Thanks for coming out, man. We really appreciate it. It's, it's like one of our legend episodes, and yes, this is one of our favorite ones. I, I been a blast. Had a great time tonight, and James, I would I can't wait to have you back on, and you guys. Everybody else who's been listening, have a great weekend. Have a great week. We'll see you next Thursday. Rock on. Yeah.